Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the Planning Committee of Derry City and Strabane District Council here uh, held in the Guildhall and online um, uh, on March the 2nd uh, at 2 p.m. Um, just for the benefit of those who are watching and from uh, your homes, etc. Uh, I'm Councillor John Boyle. I'm standing in for somewhere in the region of 10, 15 minutes. Um, the chairperson uh, is away on other council business out of the country at the minute, and the vice chairperson um, is on his way. Uh, I've been reliably informed and will be joining us um, hopefully by about quarter past two. Um, but to, uh, in, in the interest of expediency, uh, and given that we we have a limited time frame to, to do the business of the meeting. Um, I'm content, uh, if you all are, to get the ball rolling. Um, I, As I understand it, we do have a, a quorum, but we'll find that out when we do the roll call. We'll be certain of that matter. Um, so just again, to thank you all for coming along today, and in particular to welcome uh, those who've joined us online, agents and applicants uh, this afternoon. So um, first item on our agenda is the uh, notice and summons of the meeting and the second item is the members attendance and apologies so uh, i'll ask Maura to deal with uh our head of planning to deal with items one and two now thank you chair members you're hereby summoned to attend the meeting of the planning committee on wednesday the 2nd of march alderman alan breslin here maria thanks alan alderman derek hussey Keith Kerrigan, also apologies. Alderman Hilary McClintock. Here, Maura. Thanks, Hilary. Councillor Jason Barr. You're on line, Mark. Thanks, Jason. Councillor John Boyle. Here. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Here on line, Maura. Thanks, Angela. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Sure. Thank you, Paul. Councillor Christopher Jackson. And sure, more. Thank you. Councillor Dan Kelly. Kelly. Councillor Kelly, I see his sure, name. Maura. Yep, got, got that. Thanks, Dan. Councillor Patricia Logue. Sure, Maura. Thank you. Councillor Kim McGuire is on his way. Councillor Philip McKinney, apologies. And Councillor Sean Money. Here. Okay. Thank you, Chair. We do. We do have a quorum. Okay, Mark. Thank you very much, members. And I can declare that we do have a forum, a quorum. We do have a forum, and we do have a quorum. In fact, um, uh, just to move to item three. Um, uh, obviously, the formality of the broadcasting statement uh, for the benefit of those who may well not be aware of it. I think most of us have heard this umpteen times by now, but we'll do it again. So I'd like to remind everybody present at this meeting in the Guildhall or indeed in attendance remotely that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. Uh, the broadcast may be terminated or indeed suspended in accordance with uh, Council protocol. Uh, due to your attendance at this meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to you, the use and storage of those images for broadcasting or training purposes and for the purpose of keeping historical records uh, and making those particular records available to the public. Uh, members and approved speakers are reminded to only have your microphones and cameras on while you're speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility uh, to highlight a request to speak. Now, evidently, the chat facility is not something that's available to members who are present in the chamber, um, and so the old traditional hands up nod to the speaker. That will suffice. So, um, moving uh, swiftly along um, to the next item on the agenda, which is chairperson's business. Uh, considering I only stepped into the, the, the hot seat here about five minutes ago, I didn't have any chairperson's business to consider. However, um, I'll pass it over to uh, Head of Planning, Maura Fox. I do believe that Maura wants to bring up a couple of matters for your attention uh, before we get into the main business of the meeting. So, Maura, again, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Members, you will have seen in your emails um, quite a number of late items. I just want to run through those and bring them to your attention. Um, in terms of item one, 
on the agenda, we have an email of an objection. We also have a cover letter drawings and further information from the agent. And as a result of the further information and the drawings from the agent, um, we have assessed the information and unfortunately we will require to reconsult road service on this and also um, consult with neighbours and objectors. So unfortunately, we will have to take this application off the schedule in order to carry out those requirements. Um, so that's item one, Chair. Um, I just wanted to notify you of that. Item two, um, we've also had further information, including an email and amended drawings and site layout from the agent. And again, that was received on the 1st of March. We also require to reconsult road service on this matter, which may or may not resolve issues, but before members could make a decision, we would have to reconsult roads and um, any neighbours on that case. So unfortunately, again, we will have to take that application back from the schedule and return it at the next available meeting. In terms of item three, we also have further late information. That's an email and a legal opinion from um, the agent received on the 1st of March. And we will deal with that in the course of the, the presentation. Item seven, um, we've received email and images and maps from the agent again received on the 1st of March. And we'll deal with that in due course as well. And item nine, um, we've received a letter from, of support from um, an MLA and that was received on the 28th of February. Um, that's that's all I have on late items, Chair. Thank you, Maura. Okay, I trust everybody um, uh, is content with uh, that piece of information. So um, just to recap, items one and items two, item two will not be heard here today. Um, a uh, little bit remiss of me, me members there. Uh, I, I just want to take a wee step back uh, to request any declarations of members interested would have been under item four. So um, if there are any declarations of interest, uh, members do have to uh, declare them verbally here and then there will be a follow up email for a write, written declaration of that interest. So uh, can I open that up? Can anybody who's out there indicate whether they have a, a declaration of interest? I don't hear anything. I'm going to assume that there aren't any. Chair, sorry, Angela here. Go ahead, Angela. I'm sorry, there's a lot of feedback on that. Can I declare an interest now? I know I'm catching you off and on there, but um, it's LA 11 uh, 2021 0375F. Now, um, I do believe that that was um, number number two on our decision list so i wasn't too sure is that what you were on about will be deferred for to next week or, or what uh, you sorry chair you were drifting on out there okay right thank you councillor dobbins uh the gremlins have obviously got to us already early in the meeting i'll just repeat that item number one and item number two will not be heard today so if you were declaring an interest in item number two there's no necessity to do so because we won't be hearing it today are you content with that? that? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dobbins. Um, okay, so no more declarations of interest. We'll move back. Um, Morris just reminded me there was something uh, that she did want to bring in again. So we're back to chairperson's business. Sorry for a wee bit of to and fro in here, but I think Maura, you might have forgot it. So go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Just under Chair's business members, I also just want to um, notify the committee that um, we have a number of potential applications that we would like to um, present to the committee before the end of year, the end of financial year, for various reasons. They may be fund independent and social housing, etc. So we are preparing for a special planning committee at the end of March. I know we've done that before. We don't have dates at the minute, but dates to follow. I just wanted to update members that that was happening. Thank you, Chair. Okay. All right, Maura. Thank you. Okay, members. So um, uh, you'll all be notified as, as to when the date is. Maura, you didn't mention a date there, did you? know? Right. But I think um, we've all become accustomed um, to the fact that there's, there usually is a, a meeting 
um, at the tail end of, of March every year. It's an annual event. Um, we, we could almost celebrate it. We do it that often. So uh, we we'll look forward to the email that comes out. Okay, members, moving on to matters arising um, from the previous uh, meeting. So uh, there are 10 pages, one to 10. Uh, do, does any member have a matter arising that they wish to bring up here today? Okay, no matters arising. We will move swiftly on to the main part of the business, which is agenda item number seven and the planning applications list. But before we do that, I'm going to give you the order uh, of uh, applications members, and this is going to be pretty straightforward for you. Um, obviously, items one and two are gone, and we will be running straight from item three through to item nine in the order that they're listed on your papers. Uh, I'm given to believe that there is a speaker. Uh, there are speakers in all of those particular items, so we are not prioritising speakers because we have one for each each one. Okay, so um, the first application on the list is item number three, LA eleven, twenty twenty zero seven zero eight forward slash O, um, and. We'll move to the presentation, and Sarah, I believe that's your presentation, so if you want to take it from the top for us. Thanks, Chair. Item 3 is LA 11 2020 This application is an outline application for social housing development for 24 units in total, and the site is located on lands at Killy Lane Road, Eglinton, immediately adjacent and southwest of Fahenfield Presbyterian Church. The recommendation is to refuse. The application was deferred at the committee meeting on the 3rd of November 2021 for a site visit, and the site visit took place on the 11th of November. The details of the site visit are within members' report. So this is the site location plan. The site is located on lands of Lane Road, adjacent and southwest of Fahenfield Press. Apologies, Sarah, Church. I'm going to have to stop you there. You were in full flow there, but I've just noticed on the notes here, there is actually a late item in reference to this particular matter, members, and uh, and obviously the, the protocol is that you're afforded the opportunity to, lead, to read through that late item before we do the presentation. So um, uh, I'll give everybody a few minutes if they want to refer back to that particular late item, which came in from the agent. And that would have went out yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, that went out yesterday, folks. Members, I should have said I was probably going to give you around about 10 minutes to read those late items because there's one of them there is a, a, a legal opinion that you may, may well want to look back over and, and detail if you hadn't had the opportunity before now. 
Chair, can I ask a question? Just because it's a legal opinion, would our own city solicitor be able to give us really an explanation or you know a summary of that? I read it yesterday, but it was quite complicated. Yeah, Philip's not actually on the call, but we we took advice from Philip when it was received um, as officers and discussed it with him. So thanks. I'm thank I'm thanks for that, Alderman McClintock. I, I would concur with you. Uh, it's not as straightforward and simple as it might at first have appeared, but that particular letter was received some time ago. So uh, the planning department did get a significant opportunity to speak to the city solicitor.
Okay. Um, thank you, members. Uh, so uh, now that you've had the opportunity to uh, look through that uh, late item, and uh, with my further apologies to Sarah, um, Sarah, I suppose we'll have to go back to the start again if, if that's at all possible. Okay. Thank you. Okay, item three is LA 11 2020 07080. This is an outline application for social housing development to provide 24 units in total. And the site is located on lands at Killy Lane Road, Eglinton, immediately adjacent and southwest of Fawhamfield Presbyterian Church. And the recommendation is to refuse. So this application was deferred at the committee meeting on the 3rd of November 2021 for a site visit and the site visit took place on the 11th of November. The details of the site visit are within members report. This is the site location plan. The site is located on lands at Killy Lane Road. It is located outside the development limits of Eglinton and is therefore located in the countryside. The site comprises of a roadside field with bases remaining of previous World War II structures. Bohanville Presbyterian Church, Church Hall and Associated Care Park are to the northeast of the site. There is intermittent trees and hedging on the eastern and western boundaries, but neither boundary provides any substantial means of integration for a development of 24 houses. The roadside vegetation along the boundary would also be required to be removed in its entirety to accommodate visible displays. So this is an aerial photograph of the site. The site is outlined in red, and this is just to show you the context of the site with the development limits of Eglinton outlined in blue. This is a photograph showing a view of the application site from Kelly Lane Road, and you can see Fawhamville Presbyterian Church in the distance, and this is a listed building. This is another photograph of the application site, which shows that the site is currently an agricultural field and a further photograph of the application site in the countryside. And you can see from the photographs that there is little means of integration. So this is the proposed block plan or concept plan that was submitted for the application. This indicates that the proposal is for 24 dwellings and is located in the countryside. So a number of letters of support were received in the application. There was 145 letters of support 142 letters where one letter signed by various individuals submitted as one package and then there were three further individual letters. To summarise, they all had similar issues and that they supported the principle of social housing as there is a social housing need in the Eglinton area. They considered the development would enhance the safety by extending the speed limit and provide more lighting in the area. It would allow for the creation of a mixed and balanced community and that there was limited land for building in Eglinton due to floods and affordability. Following Council's acknowledgement of the letters received, officers were contacted by two people to advise that they did not sign the letters of support. And considering the representation objections, there were 22 objections received, and to summarise, they raised the following issues. The fact that the site is outside the development limits and is located in a green belt, potential if approved that there could be an extension into the adjacent field for further development, traffic concerns, increased sewage pressures, hard standing and adding to surface water runoff. The site is not served by public transport, removal of the structures on the site that would have provided habitat for bats. The information has not been provided to sort out contamination issues and archaeology works. Eglinton should, not, should have more private homes and not social change in character for a rural area and extension of urban development, loss of farmland and not a suitable site, and a detailed consideration of the objections and the letters of support is set out in members' reports. So in terms of the consultation responses, Water Management Unit, Natural Environment Division, NI Water, SAS, Locks Agency, Environmental Health, DFI Rivers and Monuments have no objections subject to conditions. There are a number of consultee issues. DFI Roads have recommended refusal of the application as the proposal is contrary to policies AMP1 and AMP2 of PPS3. The proposal could prejudice the safety of non-motorised users as the improvement works required to the existing footway network, including the provision of street lighting to accommodate pedestrian movement, has not been provided or demonstrated. Historic Environment Division Historic Buildings considered the impacts of the proposal on the listed building and advised that the proposal would have an adverse impact on the listed building at Fawhanville Church and Hall and therefore would be contrary to PPS 6. 
Northern Ireland Housing Executive have advised that they are not supporting the application. They do not consider this site to be within the Eglinton Housing Needs Assessment Area, and therefore they are not in a position to confirm housing needs for the site to be developed for social housing and have not supported the proposal. So the relevant policy consideration the application has been assessed against the RDS, the SPPS, PPS 2, 3, 6, 7, 8, 21, 15 and the guidance of creating places. So in terms of the key policy issues, the site is located outside the development limits and is located in the countryside. The site does not read with Eglinton Village from a visual perspective. It is located 200 metres from the development limit. The site would mar the distinction between Eglinton and the rural area, introducing a house and development that would create urban sprawl into the countryside and erode the rural character. This would set an undesirable precedent for similar house and developments on other lands outside the limits of development. There are no overriding reasons why the development is essential in this location and could not be located within the divine, defined limits of Eglinton. The principle of the development on this site for a housing development of 24 houses is not acceptable and therefore this proposal is contrary to the Dairy Area Plan. And considering PPS 21 CTY1 development in the countryside, this application does not meet the exceptions test to allow for development in the countryside. Policy CTY5 social, housing, social and affordable housing would allow for a group of no more than 14 dwellings adjacent to or near a small settlement to provide social or affordable housing to meet the needs of the rural community. This application is for 24 dwellings and exceeds the numbers that this policy would permit. And considering CTY2A, new dwellings in existing clusters, the agent and the supporting information considered that the site was located within an existing cluster. Officers do not consider that a site, the site is within an identifiable cluster. Whilst there is a church and church hall, the site is not located at a crossroads. CTY2A would allow for a dwelling at a cluster, but this application is for a housing development of 24 dwellings, and therefore this policy would not be applicable. In considering CTY8, Ribbon Development, PPS21, officers are of the opinion that this development would constitute a ribbon of development and it does not respect the existing development pattern in the area and therefore the proposal would be contrary to CTY8. CTY13, Integration and Design of Buildings, would allow for a building in the countryside where it can be visually integrated into the landscape. However, this application is for a housing development of 24 dwellings in the countryside and the site is open and exposed. The roadside vegetation would have to be removed to accommodate the visible displays. This housing development in the countryside would not visually integrate into the landscape and would be highly visible, and therefore the proposal is contrary to CTY 13. CTY 14, rural character of PPS 21, is also applicable, and officers are of the view that 24 dwellings in the countryside would change the character of this rural area. The housing development would be prominent in the landscape. It is a suburban style development and not suited to the rural location, and does not respect the traditional pattern of settlement in the area. The roadside frontage dwellings would create a ribbon of development, and therefore the proposal is contrary to CTY 14. This proposal is also contrary to CTY 15, the setting of settlements, in that it would result in urban sprawl outside the limits of development and to the countryside. So officers have considered the social housing need. The Northern Ireland Housing Executive advised that the site is not within the Eglinton Housing Needs Assessment Area and they are not in a position to confirm housing need for the site to be developed for social housing and have not supported the proposal. The Housing Executive have also stated that the application site sits in an area of greater rural context, close to the fast-moving Killeen Road, with cars often moving at or high speed leading into Eglinton. Access to amenities, including public transport, is poor and the site is quite isolated. So there are other policy issues. In terms of PPS3, improvements are required to the non-motorised users' connection from the site to the village. The speed limit at this part of the road is 60 miles per hour. The works required would include improvements to the footway and crossings and also provision of street lighting. The works required are not located within the red line boundary of the application site. 
There is no mechanism to guarantee delivery of the required works when they're not located within the application site boundary. DFI Roads also advised that the design and the layout to create in places standards would impact on the layout, and this is likely to reduce the numbers that could be achieved on the site. This proposal has not demonstrated a safe and sufficient movement connection for non-motorised users, and therefore the proposal is contrary to policies AMP1 and AMP2 of PPS3. So in terms of the late item legal opinion that was received, officers did receive this correspondence from the agent and correspondence in the 21st of December 2021. And the, the agent's correspondence was also accompanied with the legal opinion letter about the use of a grampian or negative condition. Officers have given consideration to the legal opinion and we would advise that due consideration was also given in the report and officers specifically commented on our opinion on the use of a negative condition and extension of the red line, which is set out within the report. It is not normal practice for officers to make available on portal copy of any legal opinions on an application. Just to advise, the agent considers that the works required to the footway and the street lighting would not need to be included in the red line of the site and suggested that the grant being negative condition could deal with us. However, officers are of, the, are of the opinion that it must be demonstrated that the works required to facilitate the improved footway could be delivered and actually achieved. There are a number of third party properties which could be affected or impacted by the infrastructure works. In the absence of detailed plans to demonstrate if the works can be achieved and delivered, and in the, the absence of a P2 certificate identifying if any third party, party properties would be affected, it cannot be guaranteed that the footway connection could actually be delivered. Furthermore, neighbouring properties would be prejudiced as they have not had the opportunity to consider any detailed proposals that are required to facilitate the footway connections and street lighting. These works are development and should be included in the description of the proposal and then the application should be re-advertised re and re -neighbor notified. Officers are of the opinion that the use of the negative condition would not be acceptable and to apply the condition could be unlawful or prejudicial to any potential third parties that would normally have been notified during the processing of an application. So in terms of other policy issues, PPS 6, the site is located close to Fahamfield Presbyterian Church, which is a grade B2 listed building of special architectural and historic interest. HED Historic Buildings assessed the proposal and advised that the application will have an adverse impact on the listed building. Amendments were submitted from the agent with regards to one house type in which HED considered its alignment, potential scale and massing on the setting of the listed building. HED expressed concerns that the site is urban in design character and fails to engage with the rural character of the established development along Killy Lane Road, which informs the setting of the listed building. Whilst one of the house types was relocated, HED advised in correspondence on the 15th of February 2022 and in a final consultation response received on the 28th of February that the amendment did not, did not resolve the fundamental concerns with the proposal. HED are therefore of the opinion that the proposal is contrary to BH11 of PPS 6 and that the development will have an adverse impact on the setting of the list of building. This proposal therefore also would fail to comply with criteria B of PPS 7. So in considering PPS 7, which policy QD1, quality residential environments, officers are of the opinion that the housing development on the countryside does not respect the surrounding context of the area and is out of character, with little natural screening or vegetation. The site is visually removed from the closest settlement of Eglinton and would appear as an isolated development in the countryside and therefore would fail to comply with criteria A. The proposal will have an adverse impact on the setting of a listed building and therefore fails to comply with criteria B. And the proposal does not provide an adequate and convenient means of access to public transport. The nearest bus stop is one kilometre away in Eglinton Village. Pedestrians would have to use the existing substandard footpath and there is no street lighting from the site to the development limits of Eglinton, which is approximately 200 metres away. This part of the road is a 60 mile an hour speed limit and officers have safety concerns for non-motorised user. The proposal therefore would fail criteria E and A of PPS 7 QD1. So just to summarise, this proposed development of 24 social housing dwellings is contrary to the dairy area plan as the site is outside the development limit and in the countryside. This would set an undesirable precedent for other housing developments in the countryside. 
Northern Ireland Housing Executive does not support the proposal for social housing dwellings on the site. The proposal is contrary to the SPPS and is not a sustainable form of development. It does not meet any of the exceptions tests within PPS 21 and is also contrary to policy CTY1, CTY2A, CTY8, CTY13, 14 and 15 of PPS 21. The proposal is also contrary to PPS 3, PPS 6 and PPS 7 and therefore the recommendation is to refuse permission. There are 16 reasons for refusal which are set out in detail in officer's report. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, bringing that report, uh, report to us. Um, members, I uh, just advise now um, we have uh, certainly at least one speaker, potentially um, three others. And so we have online with us uh, the agent on behalf of the applicant, uh, Lee Kennedy, uh, a supporter of the application, Paul Hardy. And for questions, should you wish to direct questions to either of uh, these two speakers, uh, Ronan Sheehy, uh, the engineer on behalf of the applicant, and Simon Adiyinka, uh, again, the applicant's architect. Um, so I will move next to Lee Kennedy. Lee, I think you know the drill by now. You've got five minutes to uh, add in any rebuttal or indeed add anything that you feel appropriate. So um, whenever you're ready, Lee, we'll go for it. Thank you, Chair, committee members. This is an outline plan and application for approval of the principle of development only. Issues in respect of the impact unless the building, design and layout can be resolved at reserved matter stage. This application is submitted under policy CTY1 of PPS 21 development in the countryside. Council have provided a very comprehensive and detailed planning report, but notably have failed to provide any weight towards policy CTY1. Paragraph 2 of policy CTY1 is critical to the determination of this plan application. This paragraph allows development in the countryside where there are overriding reasons why that development is essential and cannot be located within a settlement. The policy consideration is therefore, what are the overriding reasons? It's clear, it's the extreme social housing need for Eglinton and cannot be accommodated within the village. Eglinton was put on the Northern Ireland Housing Executive all men's social housing need perspective in 2016, where all housing associations were urgently tasked to seek lands for social housing. In 2018, the need for social housing in Eglinton was 14 units. Last year it was 54 units, today it's sitting at 67 units. This is an increase of 53 units in four years. The figure of 67 homes does not take into account the 14 homes already built in 2019 at Colna Funny Road, next to the petrol station, or the nine homes approved at the Ballygodden Road, where development is due to commence very shortly. The other part of the policy asks why this development is essential at this location. This is very straightforward. There are no land within the development limits of Eglinton for social housing. Planning officers have indicated in the planning committee report three potential available housing sites within the village. Each of these sites have genuine reasons why they've not been built out to date. Caramoney Road, 40 units, has full planning since 2009, but has never been all, never been built out. It's been on from the market for sale, but financially not viable for any housing association. Ballygodden Road 97 units was refused planning permission by this planning committee and it has been appealed to the Plan and Appeals Commission. This is no certainty of approval neither. Ballygodden Road 11 units is currently under consideration. This site was previously refused planning permission by the PAC in 2018 and I note environmental health still have strong concerns towards the development. Also, each of these sites are in private development ownership whom I believe have no interest in providing social housing. In relation to the proximity of this site to amenity services in the village, this site is closer to the services of the village and some of the existing built housing developments off Woodvale Road and Mill Path. This site is actually located 165 metres from the Ben Bowen Bus Trusted, which has become an informal local service centre for the village providing a vast range of community services, normally only found within village centres. It's our view that this is the optimum location for new development for Eglinton. It's, an, it's adjacent to an existing church and community wall. It's within a seven minute walk from the nearest bus stop 
It has formerly been housing accommodation for the Royal Navy and it has good accessibility and connectivity into and out of the village. It only requires minor upgrading works to the existing footpath. We fully understand the concerns surrounding this application, but let's be realistic. The dairy area plan was published 22 years ago. It's 11 years beyond the snow snow ended. And if residents of Eglinton are to wait for the conclusion of the new area plan pro process, Eglinton will see our social housing home for at least three to four years. I thank you for your time, members, and I pass you over to Mr. Hardy. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah, can, I, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. We're, we're not hearing you great. Um, okay. If you could perhaps speak up. Yeah. Uh, can you hear now, uh, Councillor? Yeah. Yep, that's better. Yeah. Uh, right, I'll start then. There is an urgent need for social housing in Eglinton. Many people have been forced to leave the village in their search for suitable accommodation. Many of these same people will quickly avail of an opportunity to return to the area where they were raised. This development will be part of the way to help in some of these people to have that opportunity to return to their to live near their family and friends. Social housing will also offer secure tenancies to residents, giving them greater protection from eviction and greater rights compared to those who rent through the private sector. This, in turn, will allow these families to put down roots and plan for the future at Nagleton. This can only enhance the community and help them maintain the sense of stability in the village, especially if those renting the houses are the same people who were reluctantly forced to leave to find suitable housing to live. The, the developer who has submitted this application has shown a responsible attitude in the past to the concerns of residents, listening to the fears and adapting his plans to meet those same concerns and fears. I have no doubt he will do so again in respect of this present development that the need arose. For these reasons, I would ask this committee to allow this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hardy, uh, and thank you, um, Lee. Um, okay, members. So we've we've heard the report from Sarah. Uh, uh, now, obviously, an opportunity for you to uh, put any questions that you have uh, to Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Hardy, or indeed um, Mr. Sheehy or Mr. Arienka. Um So, members, I'm opening it up to the floor here and online. We'll go with Councillor Gallagher, and then I'll come to you next, uh, Alderman McClintock. Just well, one from Mr. Kennedy, and, and as regarding you know your on the presentation, the high social need uh, for the area. Could, could you tell me why the Housing Executive hasn't supported this application? Is is there a, a reason that you'd be aware of that they're not supporting it? If there is such a high social need. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gallagher. My understanding is that the housing executive is now working in conjunction with the planning department in the involvement of the new area plan. And they have given a commitment that they will not support any further applications for social housing outside the existing development limits of any village throughout the Stabran and Terry district. Okay, Councillor Gallagher, yeah. Okay, Alderman McClendick. Thanks, Chair, and thanks, Lee, for the presentation. And I think actually that really my question was much the same as Councillor Gallagher's because really much of what you spoke about was about the social housing need, which the housing executive are not confirming. Mm -hmm. And I suppose um, uh, my thinking is, is that because the so as a social need for the village of Eglinton rather than this area outside of it. But I think you've probably uh, answered really in the question that Councillor Gallagher asked you, unless there's anything else you do want to add to it. Thank you. Um, um, is there anything you would like to add to that, Mr. Kennedy? Uh, my, the social need has been extended. There has been housing provided. There's 14 houses has been provided on the Kilna Funny Road next to the petrol station in 2019. At that time, I think the need was 30 units. It seems to be an increasing need for the village and no developer or no housing association can get any land within the development limits to accommodate that need. And what I was saying in my presentation there 
is that if we have to wait for the conclusion of the new local plan status, it's going to be another three to four years before A, social housing development is provided within the development limits of Eglinton Village or any other village within the district for that matter. Okay, thank you. Um, next uh, indicated speaker in the uh, chat box, um, Councillor Jackson. Thanks, thanks, Chair. And I suppose just like the previous speaker, my question was focused on around the, the housing executive need because regardless of the support um, for this application by the housing executive, we can all, everybody in this chamber um, can recognise that there's tremendous um, need for social housing right across our council area and, and Eglinton's no different to that. Um, it, 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 was, it is concerning that um, that the housing, the, the housing executive aren't supporting applications um, that, uh, and taking into consideration anything all our land, um, the need for the thousands of people that are on the waiting list currently. But Lee, um, I suppose just give, given the yeah. fact that you've answered that question, um, I, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to repeat yourself. But you did reference um, a site history on that site um, where there was um, dwellings there before. Um, could you elaborate a bit on that? Yes, surely, Commissioner. It's my understanding that the site back in the Second World War was actually the accommodation for the Royal Navy. It was called the Emerald Barracks. Uh, maybe if I brought Mr. Hardy on, he's a part of the local historian group in Eglinton. Maybe he could give you more details in relation to the uses of the site. Yeah, uh, I'll try and really, yeah. Um, it was uh, part of HMS Gannett, which was uh, where the airport is now. And there was used for sort of living quarters and, st and stuff like that there. So there has been buildings on that before. And that was from through from 1940s, 50s, and maybe even at the 60s. Uh, uh, so it's, the, that is correct. That, the, that was called the Emerald uh, the Emerald site. Uh, and there's quite a few sites around here. St. Canis's Park itself is bald in an old site, the Collingwood site. So there was a precedent there for that there as well. If that helps. Uh, I would take any other questions. Okay, Councillor Jackson, are you content to move you? Move on. No, um, no, I'll contend with that. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Um, I have no other indicated speakers, members. I'm going to give um, uh, those who are online, if you want to put under the chat box, if you want to speak. Uh, there's no one in the chamber indicating anything. So, in the absence of any further questions for the agent and other representatives, Chair, Chair, sorry, can I just make one point of clarity? Who's that? It's Lee here, the agent. All right, go ahead, go ahead, Lee. I'll give I'll afford you the opportunity. Yep, yeah, go ahead. In the planning in the planning department's presentation, they said there was no P2A received or no amended red line for the footpath. It actually was. It was submitted on the twenty second of November. The red line of the site was actually extended to include the footpath and the minor upgrading works. Did the footpath connecting the site with the village. The amended red line was submitted along with the P2A serving notice on road service. Road service had a discussion with our engineer who actually confirms that all of the upgrading works is in the public domain. It doesn't have any impact on any third party land and those works are minor. What we had done, we had submitted them on the 29th of November. The planning department actually came back during December and asked us to provide full work and detailed drawings showing the locations where the upgrade needed to be done. That's exactly when we went and got the legal opinion about the negative condition on the planning application. So what I am saying now is that the application can be approved with the amended red line incorporating the incorporating the footpath plus with a negative condition indicating that the development and the housing development cannot proceed until the minor upgrading works are complete. 
Well, Kayleigh, thank you for that. Um, and I'm sure members may well wish to investigate that further. Uh, and that opportunity is arising now anyway. Um, but thanks for your um, your contribution in relation to the red line. Um, members, now uh, opening up to the floor for questions to our officer who presented the report, Sarah. Uh, I have Councillor Logue. Councillor Logue. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it's not really a question. Well, I suppose it is. It's a bit of clarity I'm looking for. Uh, um, it's just on the, the guarantee that the housing executives uh, advise the planning committee that they will not be, or not the planning committee, the planning department, that they will not be um, supporting any application that comes in that is outside the, the development limits. Um, due to the, the new LDP. Um, that's the first I've heard of this. Um, so I was just wondering who did they give that guarantee to? Who asked for that guarantee? And, you know, a wee bit, of, wee bit more information about that, please. Okay. Um... Okay, I haven't got any indicated speakers or any further questions. And I'm about to offer the opportunity to Sarah to answer Councillor Logue's uh, question. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Logue, the correspondence that we have received on file from the Housing Executive clearly states that they do not support this proposal. Um, they have made a, a reference, I suppose, to the other to two other sites um, outside Eglinton where they did support the proposal and they have clearly set out the reasons why they consider the site is different to the previous ones that they have supported. There is a reference to the LDP process, but there's nothing to say that they are not going to support any other social housing applications outside of the development limits. Now, what they're saying is that They'd be looking, you know, at PPS 21 CTY5 and proposals being made under that policy, but they haven't actually stated that they would not be supporting any future applications. Now, they are specific to this site in terms of the housing needs assessment for Eglinton, and that's why they're not supporting the site in this location. I hope that gives you a bit of clarity. Okay, Councillor Logue, you're content with that? Yep. Okay, any other questions, Councillor Geller? Just in, in regard to the actual site itself, I've been a greenfield site or a, a brownfield site, as in it's been raised about all our buildings been on it previously. Okay, there was previously um, structures that were part of the World War II but there currently is no buildings on that site, so officers would not consider this to be a brownfield site. Um, it is an agricultural field. There is acknowledgement that, yes, there were previous historical buildings on the site, but they no longer exist. Okay, any other questions for Sarah, members? On online, on the chamber. Yes, Councillor. Can I speak? Sorry, 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 uh, sorry, sorry, Simon. We've sorry, asked the opportunity at, at this okay. point for, for agents or, or representatives of the applicant to engage in the process. I regret to say that's part of the protocol. I don't make the rules. I have to just make sure they're kept. Um, so I do have a question for you, Sarah, and it's actually in relation to the... Uh, I wanted to further investigate um, Lee Kennedy's assertion there in relation to the change in application and uh, where the red line was and where the red line currently is, or could you, I suppose, outline what the background of that is for us? Uh, there seems to be some confusion, or it's, it's, it's certainly introduced some confusion in my mind. Okay, so um, that is correct. Mr. Kennedy did submit an amended P2 and serve notice on DFA roads on the 29th of November 2021. And he also submitted an amended location map, site location map, to extend the line to include the land that would be required for the upgrade of the works to the footway. However, on receipt of that 
um, officers requested that for a further 1 to 500 detailed plan to demonstrate what the actual works you know what the works would were to be required so that we would have an understanding what works had to be undertaken um, to upgrade the footway and to provide the street lighting and so that we would have an understanding if third party land would was actually in fact required so following that we then received further correspondence after we'd requested that further information just to clarify those matters on the 21st of december which was also accompanied by them with the legal opinion and council officers were asked then to no longer consider the amended red line or p2 so that plan is no longer as part of the application we've had to revert back to the original red line of the application site that was submitted okay that's grand that clears that up for me um somewhat uh, i note as well if, if we could maybe investigate that that element of the um of the legal opinion uh just for clarity the report as indicating that were we to um, take the course of action suggested in the legal opinion, then there would be there would have to be further consultation and neighbour notification. Is that, that is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Well, officers are of the opinion that the works that are required to the footway and by providing the street lighting would need to be included within the red line of the application. And we would also need a detailed plan to demonstrate what the exact works are in order for us to be able to provide a condition. The agent has offered a negative condition and the condition that he has suggested is that there would be no part of the development um, either occupied or potentially commenced until these works, the details of these works would be brought forward and submitted to the council. But um, we, we don't consider legally that we could actually put that condition on at this stage if members remain to approve it. Okay, members, any other questions? Councillor Dobbins. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> just a question there uh, to you, to Sarah. Uh, to your last statement there, why, why can that not be done? Um, I, I would just like an answer there because this isn't sitting well with me. Um, we're on such a deficit um, for for housing out there, and like where else can they build? There's there's they're running out of land, like like in other areas of the city, they're running out of land to build on. So I, I would just like like to ask why um, with regard to your your last statement there. Okay, I'm going to come to uh, the head of planning first, uh, and Sarah. Then you, uh, you're welcome to add anything that you want, uh, you feel appropriate. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, Councillor Dobbins. I think you know we have and we do um, use negative conditions. It's not the principle of the use of a grampian condition. Um, members have to exercise judgment in those circumstances. In this case what officers are saying is the scale and extent of activity outside the red line, the nature of it, the fact that there's third party ownerships and certain a lot of uncertainty in regard to it um, means that officers don't know and we have to take a judgment call as to whether we think something is deliverable or achievable and whether that have an impact on whether the actual proposal can happen. And I suppose in this instance, there's also concern about prejudice against others, because at this point, we don't know, have enough detail as to what impact that may have. And I suppose that's why um, officers have come to that um, judgment. And um, as I say, we did look and consider the legal advice regarding this. We often put on gramping conditions. We're very familiar and used to it. We've dealt with massive housing developments and mixed use developments in this council, it's not the principle of considering it, it's whether or not in this case it's appropriate. And I would say that we, we, we sought advice from our legal team and we also discussed it between ourselves and we're all in agreement in this case, we don't think it's appropriate. So hopefully that helps, Councillor Dobbins. Thank you, Maura. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Dobbins. Has anybody else got any questions for Sarah? Councillor Gallagher, back to you. 
Thank you, Chair, for letting us in. Just how someone up this in, in, in my head, I mean, we talk about red lines, and, and, and there seems to be walking off two red lines, I, and a bit of confusion that, and, and planners reverting back to the original red line, and the applicant <laughs> walking off a different red line, and all the stuff around, I, uh, you know, Council's legal position, planners legal position around can't set. I, if this was to go through today, we can't set conditions that would cover that legality. We haven't got too many options here today. Our options are, are deferring this application and seeing if we can we can clear those red lines, or or we have to go with a recommendation that that's before us. So I I don't see, you know, the the decision making either. We either defer it or we go with the recommendations as outlined. Because what what you're actually telling us is if we were to overturn this recommendation, we'd actually be going outside our legal remit. You no, know, if that if that's and I know Slicer's not here to give us that, those guidelines, but my sense is if we were to approve this today, we'd be going beyond our boundaries. Because we we've been Outlined the legalities that we would be crossing over. Therefore, we can't approve it. But can we defer it to see if we is that a possibility? So I'm I'm, I'm chucking that out there, Chair. Okay, Councillor Gallagher. Um, thanks for that for now, um, Councillor Jackson. I think you've indicated you want to come back in again. Uh, so uh, go ahead, Professor. No, and it's, I suppose it's a follow on from Councillor Gallagher's point um, around the options that are available to us today because um, I, I think it was, was Lee Kennedy who highlighted or reminded us that this is an outline application. Um, and what we're discussing here and deciding upon is the principle of development on this site. Um, there, there will if if the committee's minded, they agree that the the principle of housing on this site is acceptable. Then, um, a, a follow on and um, full application and reserved matters application would, um, would follow. So, I just wouldn't mind um, a officer's opinion on that because I, I know Councillor Gallagher suggested that our our our, our options are limited. Um. And the, the the direction or advice that we've received from the agent um, suggested all our ways. Thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, the head of planning, I'll come back on that one, uh, Councillor Jackson. I suppose, members, the principle of the development is the issue here from an officer perspective. It's outside the development limit, and there needs to be an exception for that. To, to be um, justified. And I suppose what I would be saying is that, you know, housing executive have a response in regard to social need and that needs to be taken into account. Um, you know, so that would be our position. You know, the other reasons for refusal are, are obviously relevant as well and they would need to be overcome in regard to justifying for um, overturning the recommendation of their technical issues, including roads issues. Um, and at outline permissions, there is an expectation usually that, you know, matters in regard to safety and access to the site would, and hurdle arrangements, quite rightly, are things that can be resolved. Um, but I would be cautious about um, not having the the detailing around uh, the the access at the external so clearly that's why we are of opinion now um in regards to that maybe sarah might want to add any more to that thanks no thank you mara and just to add um i suppose the impact on the listed building is also something that hgd have I mean, strongly advised in their consultation sponsors that they are really concerned about the impact on the setting of the listed church. So that's just something else that needs to be given a bit of consideration to. Alderman McClintock. 
Thanks, Chair, for letting me in. And I think we do have to be mindful that there are 16 reasons for refusal here. And I do understand the argument. I understand the arguments, first of all, I suppose, for the need for social housing, even though the housing executive have gone down that line. I have not confirmed that in this case. But I do see the adverse effect that this might have, not only on the, the listed building of the church, but I think it's it's the character of the village of Eglinton as well. This is an isolated site. It is out in the countryside. And, you know, I think we have a lot of things to take into consideration. But I certainly would be minded that the um, the recommendation from the officer would be the correct one in this case. Thank you, Alderman McClintock. Um, I don't see any other indicated speakers or questions from uh, anybody on the committee? <clears throat> Just to say, uh, one of my concerns, well, if I can take off my chairperson's hat for a second, one of my concerns would have been that there was a lack of guarantee uh, going forward uh, in relation to um, third party ownership uh, of lands that might have footpaths going through them. Uh, and I know that perhaps that could have been worked on and worked through. I'm not. Uh, that's more thinking about thinking out loud about what you're saying, Councillor Gallagher. I don't don't know if I'm not so sure. Uh, I was putting the brakes on this would manage to break the log jam with that, but it's just what I'm, th I'm thinking about as as a as a as we come to a vote, um, and we are coming to a vote, members. So, Councillor Gallagher, do you want to come back in again? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, for Megan. Chair, and I'll go back to what I said earlier. I think that you know, because of this, um, people walking off different red lines and the implications of walking off different red lines, I think possibly I propose you no know, uh, a deferral. And at, at the very least, go back to what Councillor Jackson was saying on the point of principle. I think that if, if the applicant and the planners were on the same red line, that we may be in a, in a, a different position to, to like either make you know, a firm decision uh, that, that takes in a lot of that stuff around social needs, and then it takes in a lot of the concerns around legalities and third parties. If if, if that red line was resolved, because we're hearing a, we're hearing a presentation from the applicant that's walking off a different red line. Uh, I understand that the planners have gone back to the original red line, and that's what they're they're doing, and that's why there's a lot of implications around safety and legalities and third parties. But going back to the point of principle, I think a deferral might. Thanks, Councillor Gallagher. I think um, I don't want to be offensive to anybody, but I think we're turning and we're turning the red the red line thing into a bit of a red herring potentially here. Um, the officers have told us what they're working to. Um, I, I would be working to the assumption that if the officers have said that they're working to a particular outline plan, then that's the outline plan that's sitting in front of us here today in this particular report. Um, and as I said, I don't want to be offensive to anybody, but the, the report in front of us is what I'm making my decision on. Uh, and if anybody has any issue with that down the line, then I'm sure they can take it up uh, at the appropriate and the appropriate matter, but the report in front of us has a red line on it, and that's the red line that I'm working on. Um, uh, it's up to members of this committee also, but speaking as a member of the committee, that's just my own personal view. Members, if there are no further indicated speakers or questions for the officers, uh, I'm going to need a proposal. Alderman McClintock. Thanks, Chair. I will propose that we accept the officer's recommendation to refuse in this case. Okay. Thank you, Alderman McClintock. And do we have a seconder for that proposal? Chair, uh, uh, Alderman Kerrigan, uh, uh, it's required I can, I, I can second the proposal. Oliver Kerrigan, I'm afraid I don't think you're going to be able to second the proposal because I'm not sure you were uh, here at the start 
of the presentation. Che, um, I was at the start of this one. I had uh, I was signed in on the mo on the mobile phone as caller user two before I signed in as the uh, on my iPad. So I was in as caller user two. Now, as I say, if you have a query, I have no problem. I can I can let someone else do it. Alderman, yeah, Alderman, present. Alderman Kerrigan, if you're adamant that you were in at the start and and you're content to second the proposal, then who am I to question you? So if you want to second the proposal. Um, Chair, and and the interest of 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 if anyone else wishes to do it, so that there's no uh, there's no query on it, I'm content to let someone else second it. But if no one else is seeking to second it, I can second it. But I'll just leave it hanging a wee minute, Chair. I, I, the Chairman, I, I, I'll do it instead. Okay, thank you, thank you, Alderman Breslin. That's fine. That clears up some confusion. Um. Okay, we have a proposal on the floor. The proposal is to accept officer recommendation. Uh, to refuse the application, um, we're going to have to. We're not. Well, we'll have to take a recorded vote of, 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 in a manner of speaking, because we have to ask each each member online um, how they want to vote on this. So I'm going to pass it over to um, Mara here, and Mara, we're we're going for and against. So the recommendation is to refuse. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to run through all the names just in case there's people on the line, um, Chair, just because um, there's a lot of people on the line at the moment. I can't see them all from, from here. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, this is a recorded vote in regard to item three, and it's a proposal to accept the officer's recommendation. Um, Alderman Alan Breslin. For. Alderman Derek Hussey. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. For Mara. Thank you. Alderman Hilary McClintock. For. Thank you. Councillor Jason Barr. Against. Councillor John Boyle. Councillor Angela Dobbins. I'm against Mara. Councillor Paul Gallagher. I'm staying. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Against more. Councillor Dan Kelly. Against more. Councillor Patricia Logue. Again. Councillor Kieran Maguire. That's right. Councillor Philip McKinney. Not on. I Councilor can't Hurt. vote more. I could just come in. Okay. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Four. <clears throat> okay, members, I get that as five, four, and five against, and one abstention. Okay, thank you for that, Maura. Uh, so, um, I wasn't expecting to be sitting up here today, so that's first remark. Uh, and secondly, certainly I wasn't expecting to have a casting vote on this, but evidently as I've been requested by the vice chair to step to step in and chair, if only just this part of the meeting, um, uh, it falls to me to, to have the casting vote on this. Um, uh, I won't be changing my vote. I voted for in the first instance. I'll be voting for again now. Okay, members, um, we're going to take a, 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 a little bit of a break. As, uh, I'm delighted to re report that the Vice Chairman, Councillor McGuire, has joined us. He did so uh, some time uh, earlier, but of course, it didn't make any sense for him to jump in halfway through an application. So, uh, if we could just give uh, Councillor McGuire a couple of minutes uh, to settle himself in, and uh, he'd come back to you as and when. Okay, thanks. Um, don't be going anywhere. Uh, okay, Councillor McGuire, thank you.
Doctors are supposed to be here earlier as well, so, so apologies for that. And we move right into item four, and I think Sarah is taking that. Thanks, Chair. Item four is LA 11 2021 f This is a proposed residential development comprising of 60 dwellings and 10 apartments with associated private amenity space, landscaping, public open space, site works and access arrangements from Mount Carmel Heights. The proposal is for 70 social housing units in total, and the site is located on lands to the northwest of Avish Road and east of Mount Carmel Heights in Straban. The officer's recommendation is to approve. So this is the site location plan and aerial photograph of the site. The site is on unzoned land in the Straban area plan and was formerly lands associated with the former or Lady of Mercy High School. The buildings of the former school have been demolished and there remains some hard standing associated with the former patches and play areas on the site. There is a grouping of mature trees to the southwestern corner and vegetation on the application site boundaries. Access to the site is proposed from Mount Carmel Heights and this site is located in an established residential area. And north of the site is Mount Carmel Heights. Avish Grove is to the southwest and Spring Hill Park to the south. So just a few photographs to show you the application site. This photograph was taken from Mount Carmel Heights. And this is a photograph of the application site from Avish Road. And the next photograph is also a photo of the application site from Avish Road. So in terms of planning history, there was a previous plan and approval on the site under application reference LA 11 2017 0252F and that proposal was for uh, 65 dwelling units and was approved by planning committee in January 2018. This permission is still live but it has not been implemented and would expire in January 2023. So in terms of consultee summary, uh, can confirm that DFA roads that the PSD has now been signed off by the roads manager and final conditions were provided in a consultation response on the 24th of February. DFA rivers, SES, water management unit, regulation unit, NI water, environmental health, locks agency and NAE have no objection. National Environment Division have not yet provided a final response on the application. However, officers considered the further bat survey report that was submitted on the 1st of February, which reclassified one tree as having a low bat risk potential. This tree has been retained as part of the application proposal, and therefore officers are content that there will be no adverse impact on bats. This is a social housing application for Clan Mill, and the housing executive confirmed support for the application, and this application will be subject to funding in this financial year before the end of March. So this is the proposed site layout. The layout is for 60 dwellings and 10 apartments. Dwellings front onto internal streets and onto Avish Road. There is an adequate mix of detached, terrace, two-storey dwellings and complex needs units and single-storey dwellings within the site. Part of the site is steeply sloping. However, the layout has been designed so that where there are retaining walls required, these will be stepping up retention with planted embankments. The existing vegetation and mature trees, especially those on the southwest corner of the site, will be retained. The proposal will provide for a communal area of play at the northern part of the site, and there's also informal open space at the southern part of the site. Rear amenity space for the dwelling units meets the guidance of creating places and ranges between 55 square metres to 100 square metres. There will be no adverse impacts on any neighbouring properties with buffer planting and adequate separation distance being provided between the existing and proposed dwellings at Mount Carmel Heights and overall the layout is acceptable. So this is just an elevation to show you house type B which would be a general needs two storey semi detached house and the single storey house type B which is a bungalow. This is another elevation just to show you the apartment building A1A, which is located onto Avish Road. It's two storey in height. The proposed dwellings and the apartments would either be two storey or single storey. The finishes proposed are smooth render walls, concrete roof tiles, timber hardwood frames. Overall, the design is considered acceptable and the apartment sizes meet the standards set out in the PPS 7 addendum. So in terms of the policy assessment, this site is located on unzoned land. It was a previously developed site with the previous use for education. And there's also a previous plan in history with permission on the site. The principle for developing the site for housing is acceptable. The layout meets the criteria of QD1 of PPS 7. 
open space has been provided in the form of a local area of play in the northern part of the site and informal open space and pedestrian connections and mature trees and landscaped areas at the part of the site at the southern part of the site onto Avish Road, which will which complies with PPS 8. In terms of PPS 15, a culverted water course, Knock of O'Burn, has been protected and a maintenance strip provided. A drainage assessment was received, which complies with FLD 3. And considering PPS 2, an ecological appraisal and bat survey were received in support of the application. Natural Environment Division requested a further survey of one tree, which was previously classified as having a moderate bat risk potential, but has now been reclassified as a low bat risk potential. This further survey report was received on the 1st of February. A final response has not been received from Natural Environment Division. However, officers considered the report and considered that it was evidence that the tree is of low bat risk potential. In any event, this a tree is being retained as part of the application proposal and therefore officers do not consider that there would be an adverse impact on bats as a result of the proposal and a condition would be imposed that the tree should be retained. And considering PPS3, access is to be provided from Mount Carmel Heights with adequate visibility space being provided. There is adequate parking provided also internally within the site. The road will be adopted by DFA and the PSD drawings have now been signed off by the Divisional Roads Manager and final conditions have been provided. So the recommendation is to approve. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we have one speaker, uh, Mr. Sam McKee. Uh, do you want to go ahead, Sam? Yeah, th thank you, Chair and, and members. I, I don't want to take up your time unnecessarily this afternoon, and I suppose perhaps just extend a word of thanks on behalf of McGettigan Homes to the Council's planning team and, and particularly to Sarah for uh, her support and efforts in progressing the application to this stage. Um, I'd be very happy to answer any questions that members might have regarding the proposals. Thank you. Okay, is there any questions to the agent? Councillor Boyd. Um, thanks, Chair. Sam, just out of just out of curiosity, um uh your this proposal, um and obviously there's there's an extant um uh, plan and approval on the site. And that was that was for sixty five houses. And That's this correct. one is this one is for sixty houses. And ten apartments, and that's the reason for uh, this coming in front of us. It's a, effectively is that that's correct, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is indeed. Yes, and, and I suppose um, the, the other thing, uh, Councillor, note is that the previous houses approved in the site were, were larger than those that are proposed. Our dwellings are all designed to meet the Housing Association guide standards, and we've also then got a number of apartments, hence the the small uplift in, in unit numbers that we've achieved on the site. Enough, Councillor Boyle. Yeah, Councillor Jason Barr. Mind just for the officer, uh, kick chair. Apologies, uh, Councillor Geller. No, I'd just like to uh, commend the, the applicant on the, on the design and layout uh, of, of this application and uh, just having a look at it. And seeing the space and seeing the green areas, I am looking at it. I think that, uh, and I, I used to live very close to that area for thirty years. I and I've seen that site, and I've seen a lot of antisocial behaviour on it since it was tumbled. I and I would only be too glad to see this happening in this area, and that I very much recommend this proposal coming forward. So good job. Thank you, Councillor Geller. Um, I see no more questions to the agent. Um, so we'll move into questions to the officer and Councillor Jason Barr. Sure. Chair, um, again, just like uh, the previous council spoke there, uh, very welcome to see this application. Um, everything. Sorry, Councillor, could you maybe uh, speak up a wee bit? Just hard to hear. Can you, can you hear me all right now, Chair? Um, again, just to say, look, uh, 
well done uh, to the officer team for getting that here, and also to McGettigans and Canmore Housing uh, for this application. Uh, everything is in line and in place, and it's great to see an application like this that can go forward uh, smoothly, hopefully. And it's just as the previous counselor did say again, uh, regarding the antisocial behaviour in the area, I'm sure that every every uh, representative uh, for the, for the Sphere and Amsterdam has got the to them about the antisocial behaviour in that area <clears throat> over the last few years, especially. So this will definitely go in some way to help with that issue as well. So uh, if no other speakers want wish to come in, Chair, I'd be more than happy to propose that we accept the officer's recommendation uh, to approve this application. Okay, uh, I'll come back to you with that proposal. There's just another speaker here. Just uh... Councillor Jackson. Chair, um, and I, I don't want to hold back a proposal. I don't have a question. It's just, again, the, the echo the comments that have been made earlier around the quality of the application that's in front of us and they commend the applicants um, for, for, for such a, a well-designed scheme um, and a quality application. And again, um, pay tribute to our officer team for for the processing of it and, and getting it they getting it they come out in a timely manner. So um this is reading through the application you, you could see um how the the positive impact that this would have uh, not only in addressing anti social behaviour issues um but meeting the, the housing need in that area. So um, if the proposal stands from Councillor Barr, I'm more than happy to second it. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Is there any other questions for the officer? No. Uh, Councillor Jason Barr, do you want to make your proposal now? Thanks, Chair. Uh, again, just uh, I propose that we accept the uh, officer's rec recommendation to approve the application. And Councillor Jackson, here. Happy to second? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chair. Okay. All in favor? Anyone online against? Chair, Chair, or Vice Chair, it's, it's Angela Dobbins here. Sorry, I dropped offline there and found it difficult. So um, I would just like that made uh, against my name okay thanks okay okay thank you so that's unanimous um item five And you're up again, sir. Next chair, item five is LA 11 2022 0031F. This is a section 54 application for non compliance of condition number 29 of outline plan and permission LA 11 2019 04310. And the proposal is seeking to vary the condition to remove the text, including ground preparation or vegetation clearance from condition 29. The site is located on lands east and west of Maidown Road, approximately 100 metres north and northwest of 23 Maidown Road, and the recommendation from officers is to approve. So, condition 29 of the outline approval. So, I'll just get it up on the slide here for you. Is it frozen? Condition 29 of the point of the outline approval reads that at reserve matters, a landscaping and planting plan shall be submitted to the planning authority. The plan shall show retention of trees where possible and native species planting. No development activity, including ground preparation or vegetation clearance, shall commence until the plan has been approved in writing by the planning authority. The plan shall be implemented in accordance with the approved details unless otherwise agreed and written by the planning authority. And the reason for the condition was to minimise the impact of the proposal on biodiversity of the site. So this is the site location plan and aerial photograph of the site. The site is located in Maydown Industrial Estate and outline plan and permission was granted on the site for the erection of four IT service and data centre buildings. And this received permission by committee on the 17th of June 2020. 
That is just the indicative site layout, which related to the outline planning permission. So this section 54 application has been submitted to vary the wording of condition 29 and to seek to remove from the wording the words including ground preparation or vegetation clearance from the condition. The request is for a minor variation to the condition 29 to allow permissible groundworks to commence. Condition 2 that was placed in the original permission also required that it reserve matters a landscape and proposal for the site would be submitted. However, this condition did not specifically request that the information would be agreed in advance of any site clearance works. Condition 18 also requires a program of archaeological work and thus required site clearance works before investigation works could commence for that condition. So having considered the content and having reviewed the report submitted during that were submitted during the outline application. It was evidence that no trees with any moderate buttress potential and no otters or badgers would be present were present on the site. Therefore, site clearance works would not have any adverse impact on any protected species or habitat. Birds are also protected under the wildlife order and vegetation clearance is not in any event permitted during the bird breeding season. So officers are therefore of the opinion that the site clearance in advance of the agreement of a planting plan at reserve matter stage would be acceptable and the recommendation is to approve the amended wording of condition 9 and that the condition could be varied. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And we have a speaker, Mark McGaver. Do you want to go ahead, Mark? Thank you, Sarah, for that summary. Uh, yeah, I just want to add um, that the purpose of the variation to the condition is to enable the applicant to proceed with site clearance works at the earliest opportunity and the request for the information uh, at this preliminary stage we deemed it to be premature and it's only after the final design of the site is known can we then proceed and supply the landscape and works so the, the information will follow in due course, but to enable us to proceed now with the necessary site clearance works, we would request that uh, approval is granted. Thank you, Mark. Any questions to the agent? No. Uh, questions for the officer? No. Any proposals? Answer many. Mr. Chair, after hearing the officer's recommendation, the officer's report, and Mr. McIver, I'm happy to propose the officer's recommendation this matter. Thank you. Propose and second, Councillor Gallagher. Um, just beat Councillor Jackson there. Um, is there anyone against the application? Any abstentions? All in favour? Unanimous, yep. Okay. And Sarah, you're up again. So this is item six. Um, item six is LA 11, 2022 01 0105F, and this is a section 54 application for the removal of condition 30 of outline plan of remission LA 11 2019 and this relates to plans to be submitted at reserve matters showing retention of trees with moderate batteries and potential. This site is located east and west of Maydown Road and 150 metres north and northwest of number 23 Maydown Road. The recommendation from officers is to approve. So this planning application seeks to remove condition 30 from the outline plan permission. Condition 30 stated that at reserve matters, plans shall be submitted to the planning authority showing retention of all trees with moderate or more bat roosting potential. No development activity, including ground preparation or vegetation clearance, shall commence until the plan has been approved and written by the planning authority. The plan shall be implemented in accordance with approved details unless otherwise agreed in writing. And the reason for the condition was to ensure protection to bats and to bat roosts. 
So this is the site location plan and aerial photograph that was approved in June 2020 under LA 11-2019-0431 and the site is located in Maidown Industrial Estate and outline permission was granted for the erection of four IT service and data centre buildings by committee in June 2020. And again, the indicative site layout that was approved at outline stage. So, officers assessment under PPS2, we've considered that condition 30 was placed on Plan Permission LA 11 2019 in order to protect any trees in the site that had a moderate or more or more than moderate bad roosting potential so that these could be identified and retained in full detailed design of any future reserve matters application. The applicant has considered that Condition 30 should not have been placed on the outline plan and permission as it incorrectly assumes that trees with moderate or more bad roosting potential exist on the site. Officers have now reviewed again the report submitted at outline plan and permission stage, and it was established during the processing of the previous outline that only trees with a low bad roosting potential were identified during site assessments. Having reviewed the consultation responses from Natural Environment Division on the 1st of June 2020, it was evident that NED did give consideration to the reports received. Condition 30 was provided by Natural Environment Division in an earlier response, but not included in their final response. Therefore, officers are content that Condition 30 could be removed from the plan and permission, and the recommendation is to approve. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Mark, you're in for speaking again. Thank you again, Sarah, for that summary. Uh, again, I'd just like to support everything you've said uh, in your presentation and my recollection of the time when the planning application or the outline application was brought before planning committee. There was a lot of pressure on planning officers at the time, and we did bring this through at a very um, I don't want to say hasty, but it was it was presented in a very speedy manner, and that obviously facilitated our client and our applicant at the time, who is progressing matters on the site. So, I believe that the the planning condition, as pointed out by Sarah and in our application documents, doesn't actually warrant its inclusion, and therefore it should be removed. Okay, any questions for the agent? No. Any questions for the officer? Councillor Jackson? Councillor Jackson? Chair, Chair, I think Councillor Dobbins was on in front of me, but um, Chair, I, I, I want to take this opportunity to declaring interest um and which I should have declared in the in the previous um application as well um as a as a commissioner of foil port um I would have an interest in this application so um I don't want to take part in the the decision making process. Thanks sir. Okay. Uh Councillor Dobbins. Thank you, Chair. Chair, can I ask, just ask the officer there, Sarah, can you just clarify, um, is there bats uh, or, or potential bat roots uh, among these trees at all, whether it be low, moderate or high, but is there bat roots in, in these trees? Just to clarify, during the outline application stage, uh, that it was identified that there was low bat roosting potential on the trees that existed on the site. So the, I suppose that there was a low moderate roosting potential on the site. Um, from my recollection, there was a further condition that, um, you know, Basically, a further survey could have been could be provided at a later stage. Reserve matters, and um, maybe Mark can clarify that. But I suppose at reserve matters stage, we're not really concerned about this condition being removed, given the fact that um, NED were content at that time that the trees on the site had a low 
roosting potential at that time. So that's why the recommendation to approve has come forward. Yeah, can I just come in here? Yeah. I, I yeah, just want ahead. to make, thank you. I just want to make uh, panel and committee members aware that the trees in question actually form part of a larger grouping of trees. And the larger grouping of trees actually extends onto an adjoining site that's also in the ownership of Foil Port. And in the past, uh, in the past six months, Derry City and Strabane District Council has confirmed in writing permission for foil ports to go in and remove all of the trees on the as on the other side of our red line. So outside of this red line, permission has been granted on the basis that a low bat risk potential exists. Okay, Councillor Dobbins, uh, are you happy enough? No, Chair, I'm not. Um, you know, a simple yes or no. Um, like, I, we're, I'm being told now that yes, there is a low um, potential of bat loose um, within this area. So why are we, um, why are we approving any sort of uh, removal of of a condition which was put on there for their protection. I'm sorry, I I, I I'm confused, and maybe if Maura, Maura, if you could come in on this, I, w I would appreciate it. Just a simple yes or no. Mr. Dobbins, hopefully I can clarify. The original condition on the permission related to a moderate category, not a low category. So therefore that was wrong because the actual and the outworkings and the detailing around um, the, the application, it was obviously became clear then that it was actually indicated that there was only a low potential. So that's why um, there was no need to put on condition in the first instance. It's only whenever it's moderate or high. Yeah, that, that's a bit clear, Maura, and I really do thank you about that. But is it not in our is it not in planning policies that um, bats as a as a species to be protected? Well, regardless of low, moderate, or high, I, if, if you if you correct me on this here, I, I do stand corrected. Um, but I just assumed, and um, was always of the understanding that bats are protected, um, regardless of their, um, low, moderate, or high. Well, I let I let Sarah come on in the detail, but I would imagine. You know, this is a outline, I think, and there's a reserve manager full to come in at a later date. Um, but in terms of the actual trees, I'm sure there are some trees to be retained at, the, at this stage, but I'll let Sarah come in and clarify on that. Yeah, just to add to what Maura said there, um, outline plan permission was granted on the site. so. At a later time, as part of the reserve matters application, there will be plans come forward to show the retention of boundary tree vegetation uh, around the boundaries of the site. Um, as part of any, I suppose, reserve matters application, um, we'd be reconsulting with Natural Environment Division if there were concerns at that time, uh, mitigation planting or additional boundary planting um, to compensate for any loss of say potential trees on the site could then be identified and brought forward at reserve matter stage. But Natural Environment Division at the time of the outline permission did not raise any concerns about any low battery potential um, on the site. I think their concern would be whether there was anything with moderate battery and potential. So I suppose at reserve matters, we will be getting further detail in at that time. Outline only granted in principle the development at the, of the site at that time. So. Thank you, Sarah. Exactly. Could I just come in with one Thanks final point for Angela? Um, 
Angela, the, the condition itself specifically requests information from the applicant where moderate or high potential exists. The surveys that have been carried out to date show that neither moderate or high bat roost uh, conditions apply and therefore it's an impossible it's impossible for us the applicant to supply any information because only low bat roost potential trees have been identified so moderate or high bat roost potential trees don't exist on the site and that's what condition 30 is specifically asking for so it, it's been touched upon, but I think it, it was a, an oversight at the time when the original application was brought before planning committee and the planning condition number 30 should never have been applied in the first instance. So it was applied in error and that's why there's maybe some confusion now. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. Mark, uh, Councillor, Councillor Boyle. No questions, Chair. I'm going to make a proposal, if that's all right with you. I propose we accept the officer's recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Members, we're just carrying out a recorded vote now for item six. And the proposal is that um, uh, that officers that to accept the officer's recommendation to approve. Alderman Alan Breslin. Or Alderman Derek Hussey. Apologies. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. It's not there. Um, Alderman Hilary McClintock. Or. Thank you, Hilary. Councillor Jason Barr. Or. Thank you. Councillor John Boyle. Or. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Or, Maura. Thank you. Councillor Paul Gallagher. Or. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Abstain, Maura. That's right. Councillor Dan Kelly. Or Mora. Thank you. Councillor Patricia Logue. Councillor Patricia Logue. Let's see Patricia on. Mora, Patricia had said she had technical problems. She had issues with. Okay. Councillor Kieran McGuire. Or. Councillor Philip McKinney, his apologies. And Councillor no, Sean I'm Mooney. Mora. Mora, I'm logged in. Oh, you're back. You're on. Yeah, uh, four. Sorry, four. go ahead. Four, please, Maura. One, two, three, four. Maura, I'm, I'm four. Also, apologies. I was in Mod Golf looking at the summary and I couldn't get back into WebEx to get it uh, to, to put, put the unmute button on. Sorry. Okay, I've got that, Councillor Kerrigan. So that's 11 4 and one abstention, Chair. Thank you. Item item seven, there is a few late items. If you want to take a few minutes just to read up on them. Okay. <laughs> We'll take a 10 minute break now because it's nearly four o'clock anyway. So. Yep.
Bring me back one minute.
I've gone as red delete items. And Maliki, I'm going to go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, item 7 um, is LA 11 2021 0206. Uh, it's an outline application for a proposed dwelling and garage. Uh, lands approximately 70 metres south of St Joseph's Church, Sleeve by Road, and uh, Claudie. And the recommendation is to refuse. Um, before you we have a site location, um, as the site's outlined in red, the application site is uh, um, located um, down off the roadside uh, uh, in an existing uh, agricultural field um, to the south of uh, an existing um, church and associated cemetery. Um, the western boundary is a stone wall uh, with an arvin, a post of wire fence with some trees. The southern is undefined. Uh, and the eastern boundary is represented by a small earth bank with uh, stones. The site rises uh, to the north towards Sleeve Boy Road. The application site uh, is located um, within the development limits of Craig Ban, um, as indicated in the Dairy Area Plan 2011. Um, with the exception of the church and the cemetery to its north, the site is surrounded by agricultural fields, um, as you'll see from the, the attached satellite um, image. Uh, it's been on the fringe of a settlement and lacking much in the way of both development immediately adjacent, uh, results in a, an overall rural feel down to the context and setting of the site. The next image before you is from an extract from a dairy area plan showing the, the development limits of Craig Ban. Um, it's, uh, it's indicated um, and the site is indicated in red just to the south uh, and outside the, the, the indicated settlement development, settlement development limits. Um, the, 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 the village of Craig Ban um, is, is Primarily, um, got a, a linear um, roadside pattern of development, um, both on the north side and the south side of the road. Um, as you can see from the map, we have the church and cemetery and some residential properties uh, alongside it. Before you, we have the policy context uh, for assessing the application. As well as the dairy area plan, as mentioned, we have the SPPS, uh, PPS free. PPS 21 in relation to sustainable development in the countryside, PPS 2 in terms of natural heritage considerations, uh, and PPS 6. We've consulted a number of bodies in relation to the application. Um, NA Water um, have no objections, subject to standard conditions and informatives. Um, DFA, DFA Roads have no objections, subject to standard conditions. Uh, environmental Health Department um, have had some concerns uh, initially regarding contamination. However, these have been addressed, uh, and EHD have now cleared the proposal. Water Management Unit uh, have just referred the applicant to standard advice from DERA, and Historic Environment Division have advised that the church uh, to the north was a list of Baldwin, but that's no longer the case, and it's only as a record now. As the site lies outside the development limit and what is deemed the countryside, the policy consideration, uh, the primary policy consideration is dealt with under CTY1 of PPS21. PPS CTY1 sets out a range of types of development which in principle are considered to be acceptable in the countryside and that will contribute to the aims uh, of sustainable development. In relation to housing and specifically single dwellings, the following policies uh, um, apply um, whereby a dwelling may be acceptable. A dwelling cited within an existing cluster in accordance with policy CTY2A, a replacement dwelling under CTY3, uh, personal domestic circumstances under CTY6, uh, a dwelling to meet the essential needs of a non agricultural business in accordance with policy CTY7 an unfilled site in accordance with CTY 8, or a dwelling on a farm in accordance with CTY 10. 
in the case before us, the applicant is relying solely on policy CTY2A. Um, that is to say that the, the proposal is a, um, a new dwelling in an existing cluster in the countryside. Um, I set out in a report that it's the opinion of officers, the CTY2A applies to development in the countryside. The countryside is defined as lying, land lying outside of, of settlements as identified in development plans. The site, the site lies to the south of the existing church, um, both of which uh, live from the development limit of Craig Ban, as set out in the dairy area plan. The church and its graveyard cannot be considered existing clusters of buildings in the countryside, uh, given that they are within the development limit of Craig Ban. Um, the agent has submitted a, num a statement citing all our approvals, which she believes are similar. Um, these cases have been considered and have, it has been concluded they are not comparable, uh, and there is all our policy considerations. Uh, um, that that were given determinant with in those particular applications. As in terms, so it, it's the officer's opinion that um, CTY two eight doesn't apply. Um, so just go by that last slide. That it doesn't apply in, in respect of the application. Um, so uh, the all our policy considerations within PPS one related really to CTY fifteen, uh, which is an application, which is a policy in relation to um, development on the age of settlement uh, limits. CTY fifteen states of plan permission will be refused for development that mars the distinction between a settlement and the surrounding countryside, or that otherwise results in urban sprawl. It states that a land that settlement's identity can be as much as a result of a setting within the surrounding countryside. Um, landscapes around settlements have a special role to play in maintaining the distinction between town and country. Approval of a site would result in a notable de facto extension of the limit um, of the settlement of uh, Cray Band to the south, uh, and therefore a notable. Uh, a notable departure from the established pattern of development, um, which, as I alluded to earlier, is roadside, uh, primarily roadside development. The dairy area plan states the development limit has been defined to permit small scale development and further expansion of the settlement. Um, quote from the dairy area plan shows that they defined a development limit within which small scale development and expansion of the settlement will be accommodated. So it was envisaged within the dairy area plan that any expansion within Craig Ban would be within the development limit. Therefore, the, um, it allows the, the settlement to expand within that specific area so as to maintain a clear distinction between the built up area and the surrounding countryside, which is particularly sensitive being located within an area of outstanding natural beauty. Um, it is offers opinion that to add an additional dwelling along this boundary within the limit, without the limit, will create urban sprawl and therefore mark a distinction between the settlement of Craig Ban and the surrounding countryside. Policy CTY1 states that all proposals in the countryside must be cited and designed to integrate sympathetically with their surroundings and must be dollar uh, planning considerations such as drainage, access, and road safety. Um, the site currently lacks uh, existing established boundaries on the west, east, and south, but the rising land and development to the north provide um, sufficient backdrop to allow a suitably designed dwelling. Uh, in terms of integration, the proposal will not result in ribbon development. Um, there are a number of existing and approved um, rural development, uh, sorry, rural dwellings outside the development, but they do not abut the development limit and therefore did not mirror um, the, the proposed development. It could be considered that the ad hoc development immediately adjacent to a settlement limit may, we may result in suburbanization. In terms of all our policy considerations, there, there's no objections in terms of amenity or site uh, access or sewage arrangements. And likewise, in terms of natural heritage uh, and the, the relevant plan uh, policies within the dairy area plan, uh, and also in relation to archaeology and bulk heritage, there is no um, objections um, or issues in terms of policy uh, requirements. 
the applicant, the applicant has submitted a late item referring to a case previously considered by planning committee, um, which they believe presents, presents a comparable precedent. Um, the case cited did not uh, just rely solely on CTOA 2A as per the, the application before us. Um, it also put forward a reasoning uh, in relation to CQA 6, which is special and personal domestic circumstances. Uh, significant weight was given to this policy by members and chairman uh, that, that that particular application should be approved. And the applicant has also submitted, image, submitted images in relation to CTY 15. Uh, and however, this has not changed the officer's opinion in relation to um, its assessment of that particular policy. So, and in summary, um, the application is recommended for, for refusal um, as there is no, override or re no overriding reason as per policy requirement of CTY 1 um, why. Uh, this dwelling should be allowed in, in the countryside, and the proposed site is not located at a cluster development in accordance with policy CTY 2A, and the proposed site will result in uh, urban sprawl of Craigbanna, and as a result, mar the distinction between the settlement and the countryside, and therefore be contrary to policy CTY 15. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Maliki, and uh, we have one speaker. Um, Laura McCausland, the agent. Hey, Chair, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Chair, I'm just coming out the back of COVID, like I'm sure so many other people. So it's just of a cough. I'm sorry to do it in your ears, if you would bear with me. Well, go ahead and start, Chair. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to address the committee in support of the application and thank planning officers for putting together such a detailed report. However, I believe that on balance, the reasons given for refusal need to be reconsidered on the basis that, firstly, the proposal is without objection from neighbours or consultees. Secondly, planning decisions are made in accordance with both the area plan and material considerations. Regarding Craig Bain, 16.44 of the dairy area plan states the department has defined a development limit within which small scale development and expansion of the settlement will be accommodated. The settlement is capable of sustaining some limited expansion and provides opportunities for single dwelling. The plan's wording means the settlement is to expand, meaning to become larger. To do this, the area within the settlement must increase outwardly if it is to expand. The proposal seeks to expand the settlement limit to accommodate one dwelling, supporting the wording of the area plan. Material considerations include precedent and appeal decisions. Regarding refusal reason one, members note my tape by typo in late item figure one. Application reference refers to the Taker Road approval when in December 2020, based on approval precedents J 2010-0359F and L11 2019-0278-O, application L11 2020-0598-F Taker Road was overturned by 10 committee votes. The proposal is identical to ours in that it was located immediately outside the settlement limit. All other surrounding buildings were within the settlement and one part of adjoining development on either side was divided by the road. Therefore, based on this approval, if committee apply the same application of policy CTY2A, this case does it fully comply with CTY1 as an acceptable countryside development as it meets the criteria of six tests in CTY2A. One, the figure one in the planning report shows the site to lie outside a farm within the development of four buildings. Two and three, the cluster appears in the visual anatomy around the focal point of the church. Four, none of the refusal reasons given are due to lack of integration. Therefore, the suitable enclosure and figure one shows the entirety of the red line is bounded on two sides with development in the cluster despite the road. Five, due to the backdrop and mature planting, the site can be absorbed onto the existing cluster and will not alter the existing character. Six, 11.10 of the report states that there will be no adverse impact on residential amenity. Regarding refusal reason two, the proposal is contrary to PPS2 and PPS21 CTY15 and would mar the settlement. Material consideration of Appeal 2013 A0133 held that given the limited views of the proposal and strong extent of its relationship with other developments, the proposal would not 
be perceived as extending into the countryside. Instead, it would appear as part of the existing settlement form. This is shown in my late item. Therefore, the proposal would not mar the distinction between the settlement and the surrounding countryside or result in urban sprawl. Page two of the planning officer's report states, due to heavy planting, much of the site is shielded and the proposal will only be slightly and intermittently visible, but the southern part will remain visible. Page 12 states, views are limited and the development limit of Craig Bain is not visually apparent as it would be in more developed small settlements. Therefore, as the proposal site abuts this development limit, which according to the planning officer is not visually apparent, the proposal cannot be considered to mar this development limit. The graveyard already breaks the roadside development by extending south. Therefore, this proposal cannot be read to notably deviation of pattern. Further planting along the southern boundary could be conditioned to limit views further. The site has limited views and a strong relationship with the cluster complying with PPS 21, CTY 15 and PPS 2. Therefore, the proposal will not result in urban sprawl and meet the policy's visual test. Refusal reason three would fall as there will be no, not be a suburban style build up due to the limited views and additional planting that could be conditioned. No refusal reason has been attached regarding the proposal failing to integrate. Therefore, it will not harm the rural character, area of outstanding natural beauty or settlement of Craig Bain. It's fully compliant with CTY 14 and won't be read as prominent in the landscape due to limited views and backdrop. Other decisions made by this council demonstrate that decision makers can and do apply varied weight when making judgment of these types of proposals, including appropriate weighting of precedent. On balance, more determining weight should be attached to the precedent of recent decisions. I'm happy to answer any questions and would respectfully ask you to overturn the planning officer's recommendation and approve this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Have we any questions? Um, done, Laura. And 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 bullet point form. Um, could you explain CDY fifteen? Why you think it? It should be overturned on CDY 15, that's for refusal of reason 2, and on CDY 14, refusal of reason 3, just bullet just point for Oh, okay, Chair, thank you. Um, as was alluded to earlier in your discussion, that there would have to be um, an exception um, to, the, to the policy. So, um, I believe in page 12 of the case officer's report, the development limit is not visually apparent, is what the case officer has said. So this would actually improve the settlement limit if this um, proposal was approved. And um, this was also the line that was taken in that same appeal that I spoke about there, 2013, um, that it would actually override um, any reasons that it wouldn't comply with CTY um, 1. But um, CTY 15 is a visual test. And if you look at item, uh, my late item, it's um, figures four and five, you can see like, that's just as an outline application that um, due, which would sort of tie in with um, it being acceptable under CTY 14 as well. It integrates well visually with the existing development of the settlement and um, it therefore wouldn't read as protruding out into the countryside. And again, I would just allude back to the planning officer's report. Um, yes, there is development on both sides of the road, but the graveyard already has brought the settlement limit down um, and it won't actually create any other infill opportunities um, as discussed in CTY 14 in the case officer's report too. Sign and that in CTY 14 um, could be resolved. It is proposed for a uh, one and a half story. That was based on the other recent approvals um, within the site adjoining um, the proposal site, um, which would read as one story facing out onto the Sleepboy Road, but also then two story facing south. So we thought um, one and a half story would be a modest dwelling. But if members were um, 
of the opinion um, that single story would be acceptable, the applicant would be willing um, to pursue a design option at the reserve matter stage at that stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, Councillor Boyd. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, hey, Laura, how are you doing? Um, hope you get well soon. Thanks. If you're not already. Um, uh, <coughs> just referencing back to your last point there, um, either a one and a half as, as opposed to a one story. Um, this is the benefit of all of us. I mean, in terms of ridge height, what would be the difference between a one and a half story and a one story? Um, thank you for your question, Councillor Boy, and your your comments. Yes, I'm getting on the on the mend. Um, the the proposal is for a one and a half story, um, and the case officer hasn't attached, or the plan officer hasn't attached any refusal reasons, um, based on that. Um, but I was just suggesting to members that um, if they felt I've just included um, it's figure five on the late item. Um, a photograph just to help people see what that visual test would look like. Um, if they felt that one and a half story would be too high, the applicant would accept if 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 they could get an approval um, for single story. And maybe the planning officer um, would be able to advise about conditions around ridge heights and um, what the applicant would be willing um, to reduce the scheme from one and a half story to single story if members felt um, it would help integrate further. But as I say, there was no refusal reasons attached. Um, and actually, the case officer's report is quite complementary, um, apart from the southern boundary, which, again, conditions could be attached if members were mindful to overturn the decision and approve it um, to help um, ver you know, visually link more um, and integrate well on that southern boundary. OK, Chair, I'm just going to, just going to have one more question, Chair. Um, yeah, I had noted actually that, that, that there was no particular intention around ridge height and the officer report. I was curious as to why it would, would have been suggested by the applicant. Um, in, your, in your late item, Laura, um, if I refer to figure four, uh, I, I, this perhaps gives me a better indication of the topography surrounding the site actually than, than in the imagery that's on our officer report, um, uh, and that's not to point the finger of blame at anyone, but I can see I can see better from from this. Now, in, in Figure Four, obviously you've outlined with the yellow arrows the existing buildings, and then the proposal site is the red arrow. Just to clear something up, and then when other approved dwelling is completed with the blue arrow. Can you explain to me a little bit about when other approved dwelling? Um, thank you, Councillor Boy, for your question. Yes, so there was um, an approval for a split um, dwelling that would front on to the Slave Boy Road that would be one story and facing south, um, it would be two stories. It hasn't been built yet, but this app proposal um, actually the, the rail line extends into that site um, to accommodate the access arrangements. So um, that's why I've included it in the photograph as uh, obviously planning history, not only for sites, but the, you know, the, the surrounding area would be um, material considerations for yourself. So whilst that site hasn't, um, the applicant hasn't built that house, it actually would once erected because of the um, approval that's on it be read as part of that, you know, this proposal would read as part of that um, visual look of the whole um, overall um, look of the cluster. And that's why I've included there just to help members consider not only what's built, but what has been approved also. Yeah. Okay, that, that's useful. Chair, just bear with me a second. Uh, as yeah. I just want to investigate this a little bit more. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming then um, a straight yes or no on this, that that, that particular approval, uh, albeit not developed yet, is inside the development limit. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So if we then go to your figure three, um, 
which is which is an overhead uh, showing showing the red line of this site. Yeah. So as we're looking at it, where would that other site be right. in relation to this site? Is it the field to the right, the field to the left, or is it across the road, or where is it? Yeah. Um, it, it's actually um, what might help um, Councillor Boyle is if you look at figure two, there's like a shaded outline of where that proposed house that's in the photograph sits. It's not shown on the aerial image of figure three, but you can see then where the red line for this proposal extends into that site of where the other house that hasn't been built sit. So it's it's figure two, it's shaded black. Um, and it's all, it was on the submitted location map with the, the approval reference on it. But um, that it isn't obviously on the aerial image from the planning officer's report, but it's on figure two on that same page of my late item. So it's not the black line. The black line is the De development, development limit. limit. Yep. It's the blue box. It's it's the um Oh right, I see it. Yeah, I tell it's, you what it is, Laura. I can't read it. It's it's not great. It's I, I, that, it's a colleague has just pointed it out to me now, Laura. Which one yeah. it is we're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Right, I got it's, it. It's, got it's it. opposite um, the church on the other side yeah. of the access lane. Yeah, that's okay. No, that 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 clears that up for me. Um, Thank you. And, and, and certainly, um, I can see see some of the logic. Okay, thanks, Laura. Uh, chair, uh, I think that's Councillor Kerrigan, is it? Uh, can I can I come in just briefly, Chair? To have a question for the agent. Question for the agent, yeah. Still. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, Laura, I'm um, just just if you can just um, touch on it here. I was I was I was going through there and was trying to make notes there. As you were discussing, and I went went through the late information as well, and I know you have reference back to another case, uh, you know, which this committee overturned, uh, you know, that was just outside of the settlement uh, limits, uh, or, or outside the line, and I know that you're referencing your this this site here is just outside the line, but I, I was just touching on your point there in relation to CTY one there, where you were referencing onto the dairy area plan. And in reference to was it section fourteen? I think uh, I just I, I didn't get it written down in time there. Um, you you know, where by you're stating that we do have the authority and and the dairy area plan, dairy area plan, which is which is the current uh, legislation to cover this this site and relation that we can uh, expand the um, ex expand and and grow. A settlement and increase the settlement limits. So I'm just wanting you to touch on that one. And as you say, state then, that is the potential of of uh, dealing with with uh, CTY one uh, that it would not there for. Uh, you, sorry, where have I written down my notes here? Craig Van, uh, you know that it wouldn't necessarily you would be extend, expanding, uh, extending. Sorry, uh, the area rather than um, being outside and therefore. And the, and the rural area rather than within the settlement limits. And then I suppose you were touching on then as well, you have stated there in, uh, uh, in relation to the site, and I see the site, and as Councillor Boyle has touched on as well there, the site does slope, the site comes down, and those additional images, to be fair, do 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 help that you can see the site better. You, you know, it gives you a better visual aspect of it when you're not as familiar with the area as, as other areas across the council area. Um, and, and, and as you state, you can accommodate either a, a, a bungalow or a story and a half or whatever whatever is, is, is deemed appropriate here by, by, by committee. But again, you are minded that, that the site is well enough enclosed, but with reference as well to the southern boundary, and you are willing to, to accommodate a, if there's a condition put on for additional planting, if that's required to accommodate it. In which case, then, if that was dealt with, you're, you're really taking out CTY, the fourteen uh, uh, argument as well would that be kind of a fair assessment of where you're coming from because it wouldn't be a suburban uh, sprawl in that. Um, thank you, Councillor Kerrigan, for your questions. I'll try. My, I've written them down, so I'll try, try my best to get um, all the points. So um, basically, 
the application that was overturned in the Taker Road that I've included the site location map um, and figure one of my late item and the you know the two beside each other just to help members see that case that was overturned um, based on two other cases um, which were one is J 2010-0359 slash F and L 11 2019 um, which was on the um, Straban Road, um, both those applications. Um, so based on both those applications, committee overturned the decision just in December 2020 um, with 10 votes. So that was where the, the precedent comes from. Um, in the Tesco stores case law versus Dundee, um, the, it was sort of held that words have to mean what they say and decision makers shouldn't change the meaning, if you like. So um, on the area plan, whenever I read it, my interpretation is that um, it's 16.44, which is page 14 of the area plan. Um, the department has defined a development limit within which small development and expansion of the settlement will be accommodated. Um, so if that and being there wasn't there, it would just mean that it would expand within sight it. But expand, if you Google what it means, or Google, say look up your, your dictionary probably, um, what it means, it means to become larger. So my interpretation is then if something's to become larger, it has to expand outside to accommodate this. Um, the proposal or the plan actually says this is to provide opportunities for single dwellings, which is what this is. Um, so that would be that that part. Um, CTUI 1, um, I believe, based on the precedent um, that this committee applied weight of their interpretation um, of policy CTY 2A in um, the December 2020 decision, um, which means then that it would meet the criteria of CTY 2A, but also in the appeal case that I used um, to justify the, the wording and to, that, that it would set this case distinct um, as an exception in CTY, again, CTY 15, um, it would actually help improve the settlement limit based on an observation from the planning officer's report who said that it's not really distinctive, you know, obviously with the graveyard and everything coming down. So this would actually enhance and improve the existing settlement which would be an overriding reason based on that appeal um, as a material consideration. Um, in terms of CTY 14, this is only an outline application. There is suitable backdrop and there is suitable vegetation. The case officer has already alluded to that in the report, I think it was page two. Um, so it won't read as harmful to the rural character. And again, with it being an outline application, design and things like that would have to be considered at the reserve matter stage. And that's where then I just added the comment that if members were mindful to approve, even if they felt um, a single story dwelling would better suit the area, um, that that would be the case. But as I say, based on the precedent of the planning history in the site that hasn't been built yet um, opposite the church, Basically, um, it's going to it's a two story facing down, which is um, what I've shown on figure um, four and five of my um, late item. And anything else in. Yeah, so it won't obviously add or create any infill opportunities would be which would be another um, part of the criteria in CTY 14 and obviously um, works and that because the access has already been approved previously um, for the other applications, LA 11 2019 there wouldn't be any um, further um, ancillary works that would harm or damage the rural character. I think that was, and obviously then any conditioning um, replanting along the southern boundary or any boundary, um, if it would help um, further limit views and aid integration, the applicant would be willing for those three. Thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you very much, Laura, for that response. Thank you. 
Okay, Councillor Kerrigan, you finished? Uh, any I'm more questions? Up at the minute, Chair. Thank you. Uh, any more questions for the agent? No. Okay. Any questions for the officer? Any proposals? Anyone want a proposal? Hunter Boy. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, Chair, I'm going to make a proposal here. Uh, based on the information provided both by the officer and indeed by the agent, um, and I actually approached this one with a particularly open mind. Uh, and I'm of a view that I should propose that we overturn the officer recommendation on this particular occasion. Again, working on a case by case basis, um, uh, as opposed to the precedent that, that has been outlined. And, and uh, I'm particularly impressed by the, by, by the idea that it would constitute an expansion of the, the settlement limit um, as outlined by the agent under the dairy area plan. Um, uh, and of course, we've had much conversation and discussion over <laughs> the last number of years about area plans. Um, uh, I do believe there is an exception under CTY 15. Um, in reality, as I, I think as well, whilst it may well not have been particular area of contention in the officer report, but if, if we bear in mind the the extant approval, which hasn't been developed, um, and then you uh, and you look at the topography as presented by the agent, uh, the that application site, to my mind, is actually more obtrusive than this application site. Uh, I'm cognizant of the fact as well that the site does directly abut the, um, the, the, the the development limit. It's not up the road from it or, you know, the length of two football fields away from it. Uh, and, you know, on that basis, I, I, I actually believe that the dairy area plan um, supersedes the reasons for refusal on this particular occasion. And on that, on that basis, I'm proposing that we overturn the recommendation. Um, well, that's 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 that for me, Chair. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I do. I think it does integrate well. The graveyard in front of it and the the backdrop behind it. Uh, Councillor Dobbins. Yeah, Chair. I'll I'll second that proposal. I agree. There, uh, John has actually covered um what I would agree with. So, um, yeah, I, I'll second that. Okay. Could I just rewind a wee bit? Uh, officers want the opportunity to speak. Or officers. Policy. Uh, Hey, thanks, Chair. Um, in the absence of any questions to the officer, I do think it's important to provide a bit of balance in terms of the presentation today. Um, it's quite clear. Um, I mean, the points are, are, are clear in terms of the, this is down to the interpretation of policy, and this is down to the interpretation of the area plan. The area plan provides um, room for expansion within the settlement limit, right? There's no evidence coming forward today, or there's no evidence coming forward throughout the process in this application that there's no land available within Craig Ban settlement limit. Okay, so that's quite a, that's a fundamental part for us to set aside the plan and also to set aside CTY one. Okay, whereby we have to say why why is it essential right outside this limit, and why is it not 
why can't it be provided inside the limit? I think as well it's important to remind um, both agents um, that all parts of PPS 21 have to be applied. So we can't just say that we feel it meets CTY 15 and and we move on that basis. We you know as officers we're required to apply all the criteria, relevant criteria in PPS 21. Um, looking at the Clearly, the house beside it that's up to the northeast is within the development limits, right? That's the one that's not built. I know the site, I've driven up and down that road quite a few times. And I think the reference and the points that are being made in terms of the officer report saying that, you know, the limit is not, not, as, vis not as visible. I mean, the, the, what the officers, I think, is trying to bring out is that this is a really rural settlement. Craig Ban is really rural. It's not built up. Um, and you know, you have the limit is round the back of the graveyard. Okay, so it's not round the back of you know a string of houses. So the limit can be seen, okay. You're, 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 you can see that as you're coming down the road. And I think those photos that the agent has actually submitted, you're looking across from the south, so you're actually looking there on to and that you're actually looking onto the back of Craig Ban, right? And that shows to me how a house on that site is actually gonna more the distinction between town and country, that figure four, that's the way I would look at that as a planner. So I think it's really important to look at this really balanced. Um, and I totally accept the points that, that members are making and, and you know, it, it's, it's entirely up to members, but as officers, this, 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 this is our balanced decision making and there's nothing that has come in that would give us evidence and numbers to say that there's no other land available within Craig Ban that could not accommodate a, a single house. So that's, that's the main points I wanted to make on it. Thanks. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, is anyone, any queries on so points made by Suzanne? No? Just this, yeah, look, th thanks, thanks for, for that. Suzanne, um, again, I, I, I appreciate the, the clarity around um, the, the figure submitted by the agent, uh, but I still stand by what, what I said uh, in truth, but, you know, notwithstanding everything that you've just outlined, uh, and I stand by the proposal uh, based on, on what I'm saying as well. Chair, um, I, I think it's not unreasonable in this, uh, uh, an event of this application to see this as an expansion of, of uh, uh, of the limit under the dairy area plan. Um, and I think that we can apply that to this application. So, as I said, my proposal still stands. Okay. Any other questions? No. Councillor Boyle, you have give your reasons. Just formally, I propose it again there. Just. Okay, just to formally uh, propose that we uh, overturn the officer recommendation. Um, based on uh, the fact that on in this particular application, the approval would be in recognition of the expansion of the settlement limit under 16.44 of the uh, dairy area plan. That's it. Okay. And Councillor Dobbins? Councillor Dobbins, are you happy to second that? Yes, yes, I am, Karen. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone against? No one against? Any abstentions? Councillor Gallagher? Any other abstentions? Councillor Mooney against. We'll do a vote, just recorded vote. Thank you, Chair. Members, this is a recorded vote for item seven. And it's a, recommend, a proposal not to accept the officer's recommendation, um, which is a recommendation to refuse. Alderman Alan Breslin. For. Thank you, Alan. Alderman Derek Hussey. Apologies. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. For Mara. 
Alderman Hilary McClintock. Or Maura. Thank you. Councillor Jason Barr. Or Maura. Councillor John Boyle. Or. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Or Maura. Okay, Angela. Um, Councillor Paul Gallagher. Abstain. Councillor Christopher Jackson. Or Maura. Councillor Dan Kelly. Or Maura. Councillor Patricia Logue. Or. Thank you, Patricia. Councillor Kieran McGuire. Or. Thank you, Kieran. Councillor Philip McKinney. Or off. Off. Apologies. And Councillor Sean Money. Thank you, Chair. So that's. 10 for, one against, and one abstention. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, item 8 is LA 11, 2021. Uh, 0450F um, proposal is a proposed new glamping site for up to six number of pods, new parking area, private amenity areas, communal covered space with new ancillary structures, uh, utilising existing access onto Tamna Road. And the, the recommendation is to refuse. Uh, the application site that is indicated in red on the site location plan attached um, is cited uh, uh, adjacent to an existing dwelling and garage at number 47 Tamna Road uh, in the park area. The proposed site is on a, a rough hillside grazing land and bounded by the existing dwelling and garage and a large stand of mature trees on the east. The ground rises to the south. south Boundaries are sparse of vegetation and typical of the prevailing upland character of the surrounding area. Uh, the site is located in a rural, rural area as defined by the area plan and is located within the span AOMB. The, the attached image, image shows a proposed layout of the site. Uh, you can see in green, if you can make it out there in the image, you have the, the six proposed pods. Uh, and some of the, the associated buildings, uh, um, the, some of the associated welfare, welf, welfare buildings uh, is indicated in grey. The site, uh, um, when viewed from the Tama Road, is actually um, in a hollow area. So this red arrow shows uh, it's down, and then you can see number 47 Tama Road in the image also. Uh, and this is photographs of the access going down uh, off of Hammer Road. It's a fairly typical post and wire fence and uh, rural access and this upland area. And again, this is a, an hour uh, image um, of, a, of a site for a, taken from the access road. So it's basically grazing land at the middle with no really defined uh, uh, level of mature vegetation. Uh, the attached images show the proposed elevation uh, and floor plans of the, the glamping pods um, and uh, the wealth, welfare areas associated with those. Again, further elevations uh, of the proposed buildings uh, associated with the, the development. In terms of the, the policy framework, um, uh, we have the SPPS uh, and the dairy area plan. Uh, we uh, with PPS 21 and in particular CTOA 1. Um, PPS uh, 16 in relation to tourism, given the nature of the proposed development. PPS 3 uh, in relation to the access, movement and parking associated with the development. And PPS 2 in relation to natural heritage uh, and its location within the AOMB. Uh, and we're also uh, um, taking into account the supplementary, supplementary plan guidance in terms of building on tradition, a sustainable design guide for Northern Ireland. Um, there have been a number of consultees, uh, um, including NA Water, who have no objections. 
The FA Road have no objections. Uh, standard uh, conditions and informants. Environmental health have no objections. Standard informants relation to um, fuel effluent, radon, and waste and recycling. Um, NAD um, were consulted. Uh, there was an associated preliminary ecological appraisal. Um, they have recommended a, a suitable buffer of at least 10 metres must be maintained between the location uh, of, of a ditch on the site and all construction, construction works. We've also um, consulted strategic uh, environmental services. Um, a further assessment was not required because it would not have a, a likely significant effect on the selection features, conservation objectives or status of any European site. Um, they have provided a, a condition regarding mitigation measures to provide a suitable buffer to protect features. Uh, again, it's the ditch, which is hydrologically connected to the River Fahan uh, and tributaries SAC. The, the agent has, uh, has submitted um, a planning uh, statement with the application uh, addressing the, the policy rationale for the proposal. Um, the date has provided a list of tourism amenities and facilities within the sparing range uh, which uh, are existing. Uh, and again, uh, as indicated, they wish to capitalise on the broader attraction of the, the sparing AOMB um, asset. And they, they also, he points out that the policy is not specific on the exact proximity of particular amenity, rather that the emphasis is on the question of whether the amenity is for tourists and is a significant tourist attraction, uh, and the fact that there are numerous visited attractions within the broader Sparrows range. Um, the agent has also said that the application must satisfy both the objectives and the relevant sections of the policy, uh, and that there is, the fact that there is not an individual tourist immunity should not penalise the proposal. Um, the greater width must be accorded to the objective of the policy uh, when interpreting or reconciling uh, these against the individual criteria for tourism development to ensure there's no conflict. So in terms of giving context to those comments, uh, what the agent is uh, addressing is the policy statement uh, PPS 16 tourism, uh, and in particular the, the relevant policy requirement uh, policy TSM 5, um, which uh, states a plan approval will be granted for self-catering units of tourist accommodation where it meets criteria A to C. Um, it is established through all our planning applications, the plan appeals that TSM5 uh, is, is the, the relevant policy criteria when considering um, the, the, the nature of the proposed development. Um, once the principle is established under TSM5, the proposal must also be considered under uh, the design and general criteria of TSM7 from PPS16. Um, in relation to TSM5, the proposal is considered under Part B of Policy TSM5 and that the applicant believes it represents a cluster of three or more units at or close to an existing or approved tourist amenity that will is or will be a significant uh, visitor attraction in its own right. Um, it is officer's opinion that the, the site is not located at are closed um, to an existing tourist amenity as required by policy. Uh, accordingly, the proposed development phase to comply with point B of TSM5, uh, rather than comprising a tourist development uh, in an appropriate location, it would constitute a, a random self-catering development in the countryside um, that could threaten the value of the, the tourism asset, in this case, um, the, the, the Sparrows AOMB. Therefore, it is considered that the proposal is not acceptable in principle when considering under paragraph 6.260 of the SPPS and policy TSM5 of PPS 16. Um, I suppose in terms of some of the, 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 the terminology associated with PPS 16, it'd be useful to, to look at the glossary uh, and to bring the state member's attention that PPS 16 describes a tourist amenity as an amenity, facility, or service provided primarily for tourists, but does not include the tourist accommodation. And then when we're talking about a tourism asset, um, we should not be confused with a tourism asset, which is described as a, any feature associated with the built or natural environment, which is of intrinsic interest to tourists. So in policy TSM5, 
what we're talking about is the first of those two descriptions, the tourist amenity. So uh, when we're talking about being close to or at, we're, it's, it's referring to an amenity facility or service provided primarily for tourists. So the site is not located at or close to an existing tourist amenity as required by policy. Uh, and uh, so it, it, officers of opinion, it doesn't meet the, the, this overarching uh, policy requirement uh, within PPS 16. Um, we have considered um, planning law, and sorry, sorry, planning case law, uh, and in particular some recent plan appeals, which have uh, very similar, part, you know, very similar parallel parallels with the proposed application. Um, the, there's an application there went to appeal in, in uh, North Antrim. The appellant's representative stated that the proposal for five glamping pods. Um, was relying on the Glen Arm Castle and Glen Arm and the general surrounded AOMB countryside, as well as the site's proximity to the Causeway Coastal Route. Um, on, on, the, on the basis that the, the proposed uh, glamping pods would be uh, close to uh, each of these uh, elements. The appeal was dismissed by the PAC, and the following reason was pre presented by the, the Commissioner. It is not located at an existing or approved tourist uh, amenity, irrespective of its location within the AOMB. Um, the policy does not specify or define what close means, though a normal understanding of the word in relation to physical locations would be a short distance from or near to something. Paragraph 7.24 of PPS 16 assists in explaining the rationale for policy TSM 5 stating that it will uh, provide sustainable environmental benefit for focusing self-catering development in existing nodes of tourism activity, uh, thereby avoiding random development throughout the countryside and safeguarding the value of tourism assets. Um, the Council considered the distance combined with the lack of ease, uh, sorry, the, the Commission considered the distance combined with the lack of ease of access from, for walking from Glen Arm to the appeal site indicated that it was not close to Glen Arm Castle or our, all our attractions at a settlement for the purpose of this policy. Um, if the example set forward in this application, um, officer of opinion that the same rationale would be applied in, in determining uh, that none of the tourist amenities raised by the applicant are close to, uh, in a sense, um, considered in that appeal. Um, having considered the tourism policy, the, we also have to take account of the other um, policies within um, PPS 21 uh, in terms of design and rural character. So policy CTY 13, um, integration design, and policy CTY 14, rural character. Um, officers of opinion, despite the open nature of the landscape, the pods are small scale in the landscape. Um, critical views from the surrounding road network are limited, uh, and long-range views are mitigated by the existing topography and vegetation. Um, a planting schedule and landscaping plan has been provided as part of the application drawings and can be conditioned. Uh, the boundary treatment uh, with reinforced planting and structural planting throughout our native species and are detailed on the planting schedule. Uh, the informal layout and landscaping seek to further integrate the site with the landscape and the location of the pause respect contours of the existing topography with the, the low level roofs following the natural gradient of the ground. Um, the applicant uh, has satisfied PPS 16 in terms of uh, his submission. Um, PPS free DFA roads have been consulted uh, and following receipt of amended plans have no objections in respect of the proposed site access. And um, PPS2, um, as alluded to earlier, um, SAS have carried a HRA on behalf of the Council and they have concluded that, that uh, having considered the, the nature, scale, timing and duration and location of the project, further assessment is not required because it would not have a likely significant effect on the selection features. And we also had a primarily ecological appraisal submitted, which NED, um, which provided no evidence of protected species or priority habitat but this was discovered on site. In terms of amenity and public safety, we, we look at the SPPS as well as TSM7 within PPS 16. 
um, as the existing dwelling is within the ownership of the applicant, it is considered that there will be no adverse impact on amenity from noise, disturbance, overlooking, or loss of light or during construction works. Um, EH have provided um, standard advice in terms of safety. The proposed units will overlook the communal outdoor space uh, and parking area, thus providing supervision of the area. Therefore, the proposal complies with policy TSM7 and SPPS in respect of amenity and site safety. So, in conclusion, the, the recommendation before you um, relates to the principle of development in terms of uh, the, the nature of the development in the countryside and the policy uh, test is set out in TSM5. The, the actual details of the application in terms of the the roads and technical details and the actual integration of the units themselves and um, officers have no objections to that element. It, it is the it's the principle of meeting TSM five within PPS sixteen, uh, and that's um, set out in the the refusal reason uh, as um, detailed in the report. Thank you, Chair. Okay, Maliki, uh, we have one speaker, David. McMeekin. David, if you want to go ahead. Yep, thanks, thanks, thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, that's good. Thanks very much. Um, look, thanks very much. I appreciate the time um, to allow you to speak at the committee. And thank you, Maliki, for um, quite a comprehensive report. Um, there's a couple of things I'd like, to, I'd like to mention. First of all, I think we're all in agreement um, that the, the Sperrins actually is an urgent need of tourism development. Um, there is a lack of, of facilities and a lack of accommodation in these rural areas. And I'd point to the Council's own uh, policy um, on, on the 2025 uh, building for the future, where they're identifying the Sperrins as one of those key aspects that they'd like to develop further. So I think from that point of view, um, we're all keen on tourism. There's a slight contradiction, I think, uh, in, 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 in our case of his report. Um, and we're glad to hear that the consultees all cleared all the consultations, everybody's content, no issues of integration at all. Yet the case officer was making a point that you're worried about um, endangering the, the asset of the sparrows. Well, if all the consultees are content, there's no impact on the natural environment, there's no impact on the visual environment, uh, how can it threaten the A and B generally? On the point of the TSM5, um, while the council or the case officer has matters have assessed it against TSM5, there's also a case being made that it, fall, it actually would fall under TSM6. All these, we've done a number of these sites around the countryside and they're all licensed under the Caravans Act. Um, so therefore they would qualify as a holiday park. And if you read the glossary on, on TSM6, it says for the purpose of PDS 16, a holiday park is defined as a caravan site licensed under the Caravans Act 1953, New Ireland, which in addition to static caravans may also contain holiday chalets, cabins, and pitches for touring. Clearly, these small uh, pod like structures would fall under the Caravans Act. So, if they're, if they're being licensed under the Caravans Act, they therefore, by definition, have to be a holiday park. Now, that may be my uh, twisted interpretation of it. Um, but in your adjoining jurisdiction of Fermanagh um, and Omar Council, um, they did have a similar application in the Sperrins in 2017, um, and they assessed under TSM6 and approved it. And I can provide a reference number for that. Um, it's 2017, LA 10-2017-0435. Um, it's there for the councillors and for the, the, the uh, planning service to, to, to consult. And they clearly assessed it as a holiday park, and TSM six was was approved. Um, and that's basically what I have to say. Um, to keep it short and blunt, um, there's precedent for it. Um, the application and in, in, in Parma, they've acknowledged the I suppose in a sense the requirement for tourism in the in Sperrins, and uh, they they backed they backed the tourism project there specifically for six number pods in the rural area. So it's the same policy being applied. I'm not quite sure why um, these kind of the flying service in this sense, applying flying department in this sense, have, have chosen this as a TSM5, but I think TSM6 is probably more appropriate in this case. And that concludes my comments. And I open for questions.
Thank you, David. Any questions for the agent? Anyone? No. Commissioner Gallagher. Thank you uh, for for the agent. And just in, in your estimation, are you saying that this proposal would go some way in supporting and developing an area of outstanding natural beauty? Yes, good question. Thanks. Thanks for your question. Indeed, it would. Um, each of these pods will, will seat four people. If we operate on the basis that they're operating for 250 days a year, if you move, if you to the sums 250 times four 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 people, it, it it adds up to quite a significant amount of people bringing into the heart of the Sperrins. and then you can you can access local villages, go for cycle rides, operate as a base for for walking, and this is the kind of development that while you're trying to preserve the Sperrins as a really in tourism. I said, like, we're not, nobody's going to be asking for a 120 bedroom hotel in the middle of the Sperrins, but these kind of niche, full diversification, um, sustainable developments, this has to be the way forward for developing tourism in this area. Um, I, I can understand the, the, the case officer's reservations about creating a precedent, but every application has to be assessed on a case by case basis. There are not really too many sites in the Sperrins um, like this where they're, they're well integrated. And all the consultees are content, um, and that's the key point. And we have to look at the, the bigger issue. You know, I suppose, are we keen on tourism? Do we want to embrace tourism, or do we want to say, you know, we have to follow the narrow strictures of a boundary of PSM five? Because in that way, you won't you won't survive. The tourism will not survive. Fermanagh have recognised that, and I'm sure that uh, the, the councillors can recognise the value of trying to promote tourism in in niche locations. In the rural area, which we will all admit over the years has been slightly underfunded and slightly unrecognised. So the council and the council are in conjunction with, with the adjoining councils are trying to develop um, tourism attractions and tourism trails and sculpture trails and so on and so forth. But you've got to get people in the countryside. You've got to get them in there to spend money in the in the, in the restaurants and the other attractions. And the fact that there's nobody there probably has a, a sense has discouraged other entrepreneurs from coming in and saying, you know, I'm going to set something up here. I'm going to set a, a bike hire business up or whatever, because there's no tourism there at the minute, nowhere for them to stay. So we're offering an opportunity here for people to come into the Sperrins, into a rural area, in the quiet and the, and the peace and calm, and, and make the most of, of, of what we've got. Any other questions? Uh, questions for the officer. Thank you, uh, Mr. McMeekin. Councillor Boyd. Thanks, Chair. Um, well, I can just um, a couple of points. Glamping sites are fairly new um, form of tourism. Certainly, in my experience, anyway, there I. I I first became aware of them probably in the last five, six years, and probably more so over the last couple of years, um, with um, the various uh, challenges presented by the uh, pandemic, for example. Is there any is there anything in policy at all that references glamping sites? Because to my mind, a glamping site by its very nature is found in the countryside and in rural areas. And the reason they're in rural areas is, is because people go to glamping sites to get away from it all. Um, is there anything in the in, in policy that references glamping sites in particular? Because they are they're very different from caravan sites. Um, and I, I can think of a few examples um, across the north that perhaps wouldn't fit in with the the policies that that, that you're referencing there. Uh, because if I, I've even been interested enough to go and maybe stay in one, but they're all very expensive um, for now. But that's kind of how I know where they are, and maybe I'll get the one on one day. But anyway, there's a simple question: is uh, uh, is there any reference in policy to what what a glamping site is and where a glamping site can be and can't be? 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so, uh, so, literally in the presentation uh, in assessing this application, we, we did look at uh, planning case law and look at uh, planning appeals and our examples of planning applications. So, as well as yourself grappling of, with the question of whether glumping was in the policy, it has been considered by uh, the Planning Appeals Commission and the, the appeal statement that I refer to. Um, uh, the, the view was um, from the, the PAC, the TSM5, um, was the, the relevant policy for assessing them on the basis that they were self catering accommodation in the countryside. Um, now, there's no mention the word glumping uh, to my mind as not mentioned uh, within uh, the, the current policy. Um, so I suppose that's the, 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 the short answer, the glumping isn't mentioned. So um, as officers, we believe that TSM5 is the, is the relevant uh, policy to assess the applications. Okay, chairs, let me back on them. Uh, right, okay, so there's no mention of but. Uh, to your mind and the mind of the planners, um, they come under uh, self-catering accommodation. I think it's really what you're saying. Um, now, I did note the, um, the PAC decision and the report was very useful. Uh, and then there, we're kind of getting on the semantics a wee bit here and the, and the, um, and the, and the PAC decision because uh, the PAC decision defines what is the, well, but basically the, the PAC decision says that the plan and policy doesn't define what close actually means close to uh, 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 tour, tourism amenity etc but neither is there a definition from the PAC as to what 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 they refer to as a short distance um, there's no definition of a short distance uh, and in the PAC decision, they basically said, you know, close to would be what would be considered a short distance, but they don't say how short a short distance is. A short distance for me might be at the bottom of my street. A short distance for you might be from your house up to Stirban. Um, It's subjective, I suppose, is the point I'm making. Uh, and while it's a useful enough, um, Maggie, while it's a useful enough judgment, can you tell me, because I don't know the neighbourhood, and it's not contained there in our report, this particular glamping site and that judgment, how far away was it from Glenarm Castle? Um, I suppose I would refer to the, the report there that they do um, define what they consider a short distance, because later on in the reports, um, they talk about the ease of access in terms of walking to and from the, the, the mentioned amenity. Sorry. So uh, they considered that the site, I don't have the exact distance, but right. they considered it wasn't within walking distance. Hey, Azure, see the motor. All right, th th thanks for that, Matt. Um, again, again, subjective. The distance I might walk may be very different to the distance that somebody else might walk. There are people who like walking. Uh, that's me, Chair, thanks. Hey. Sorry, David, I can't let you back in. It's, uh, oh. The protocol is clear. Councillor okay. Dobbins? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Margie, as we have alluded to time and time again, it is interpretation of um, the policies. Um, and in fairness now, I, uh, in former times, would be a great walker. I, I, there was nothing great than putting on your hiking boots and a way out into mountains there, albeit Donegal was my favourite spot, but there would have would have been lovely to actually have somewhere that could have been a base, you know, for um, walking and hiking, a base to go back to. And to be quite honest with you, looking at these um, glamping, uh, and I think Councillor Boyle actually referred to, it's not a caravan site. It it, it is glamping, and to me, it's very it's. It would be integrated into um, the surrounding area, you know, of natural habitat. So, um, I, I'm, I do see. It's not my interpretation. I, I disagree with what what you have said, um, 
that it's okay, it's not in an existing hotel or a self catering complex, but it is close to uh, a tourist amen a, a tourist area, which which is the spare in themselves. Uh, and um, what you had said that there was no overriding reasons why this development is essential to this rural location. I argue that point. I, I think the glamping is now um, time and time again have come uh, before us and it is now becoming essential. People don't want to live and want to stay in caravans, like to mingle with a uh, natural habitat or surrounding area. So I, I, I'm sorry, Maliki, I disagree with your um, reasons here uh, and I'm of a mind to actually go the opposite way, but willing to hear other views. Thank you, Councillor Dobbins. Councillor Jackson. Um, Gormio, good chair. And um, I just want to thank um, David for for um, his presentation to the committee. And I want to thank Malgi for a very comprehensive report and a very con comprehensive presentation as well. Um, and I suppose as a council, um, we're committed to developing and progressing a tourism strategy for the Spurns. And I think that's been well rehearsed at, at different committees. And one of the challenges that that presents itself is is the lack of tourist accommodation and around the ter uh, the the Sparrows area, and that's that challenge isn't unique to ourselves. Um, that challenge is shared by neighbouring council areas, and I know that it was interesting to hear that a neighbouring council area in Fermanagh and Oma have have taken a different interpretation or a different approach in policy terms and in, in when it, in, in terms of an application that's that was presented to address that particular need and I know Malgi um uh, uh, Malgi had um outlined the challenges from an officer perspective because there's no reference in any planning policy in relation to glamping. Um, and we looked for direction in terms of um, the planning appeals. There's have, once, once we were looking for direction on this application, did our council um, consider the decision that was taken by um, our neighboring council? And, and have, did we take into consideration that the, the fact that a very similar application was assessed under TSM six. Yeah, through the chair. Um, well, so, and the the applicant did uh, cite a number of um, policies that he believed that the application uh, met with uh, in its uh, original submission. So we were aware of the, the case being put forward for TSM six, although I'm, I'm not uh, aware of the details of the particular application in our neighbouring council. Um, of the view, uh, and I think it was dealt with in an appeal I recall as well from looking through, was that the the, the definition uh, when it's read for holiday park um, is that the holiday park is defined as a caravan site, uh, licensed under the Caravans Act, and then comma, which in addition to static caverns may also contain holiday chalets or cabins. So like, those are, are like, considered to be ancillary elements of a, you know, an established caravan park where the caravan park mm -hmm. is, the, is the principal use. So again, um, it, it was a, a, a witted consideration looking at the, the, the case law across a number of cases. Uh, and, uh, you know, that that's why we uh, assess under TSM five, um, because this has been considered uh, um, a number of times at appeal. Thanks, Chair, and just to agree with the comments of the previous three councillors, 
uh, I think that um, I can absolutely see where Maliki is coming from because as an officer he has to uh, rigidly stick to or maybe not rigidly, but he has to stick to the policies that are before us. Um, for those who are in the glamping, I certainly am not one of them, um, but for those who are in it, I absolutely take Councillor Boyle's point of view that those who want to glamp do it to get it away, get away from everything else. They don't want it near a hotel or a that sort of a facility and I think that really we're in a situation because the policy doesn't adequately cover what is a relatively new form of tourist attraction so just to briefly say that I do absolutely agree with the, the comments made by the last three councillors on this thank you it's not a question as such but I following on from over there like hi and probably difficulty that Planners have had and, and focusing on TSM five and uh, not looking at TMS six such, but I on around other stuff around the material considerations and I and seem we we look out there and talk about an area uh, outstanding natural beauty and uh, there's a lot of people out there that, that feel that these areas are under attack. Do you know from windmills and mining and drilling and all the you know the, the things that, that are happening out there and when we see a project that's coming along and and it's talking about you know sustaining development on the countryside that's promoting uh, uh if, if you want to call it come back to what councillor boyle says you know around the affordability issues that we normally gets established with these projects the, and way this one was assessed you know i'm talking about at the side of a hotel and usually these hotels are very five-star hotels and usually these are you know beyond the reach of ordinary tourism high cost and then we're talking about trying to sustain the countryside trying to sustain affordable tourists that can go under the countryside like an orc mentioned talked about then i think that we should be given material consideration to tms6 that has set precedent on our council and i think that's where we should be going with this project around us and when we look at our local area plan we're talking about giving get a big consideration to trying to get tourism in these areas that ha ha has been absent and then us as a council investing money in that then we should be supporting projects like this that come in thank you chair Uh, just, just as a supplement, I mean, I, I think everybody's picked up on it, and I'm not saying I, you know, I, I'm responsible for it. I think we're we're all thinking the same thing, anyway. Um, and 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 and, and, the, and the policies don't make it easy for officers and, and instances like this. As I said, it's a relatively new uh, form of um, a tourism. And Councillor Gallagher's right. You know, I mean, our ambition is to try and grow uh, the, the, the sparrows in the area of na outstanding natural beauty as a, as a tourist attraction. If people can't stay there, they're not going to visit. Uh, and we need to make it easier for people to pursue a healthier lifestyle. And what could be healthier than, you know, trekking across the sparrows? I mean, there's so many people that like to do that. It might be my bag, but there's lots of people who want to do it. Just in, in, in relation to, you know, proximity to... Um, uh, uh, tourist attractions, for want of a better way of putting it, which is which is what the policy is actually saying. One could argue that the Sperrins themselves are a tourist attraction. And the glamping site is slap bang in the middle. This one would be slap bang in the middle of the, the tourist attraction. Um, uh, and that's where the judgment here from the PAC is, is a bit... It's a bit restrictive. Um, it, it, con it constrains officers because because of the nature of the difference between close to and short and a short distance from, but I mean, uh, just to just to conclude, chair, um, if you go onto the map and you do a quick Google map from where this application site is, uh, you can drive to Ness Woods in twenty minutes from it. You can drive to Gorchin Glen in half an hour, uh, and if you really want uh, a trip, you can get to the Seamus Heaney Home Place in forty minutes. Those are all tourist attractions, anyway. And it's bearing uh, AONB uh, as also uh, a tourist attraction. Um, 
that's a tourist asset and it's an asset we're not we're not realizing that asset because planning policy is actually preventing our officers from um from tackling it and Councillor Geller is right TSM6 and Oman for Mana have actually used it and they're using it to their benefit uh so I think I think we we, we need we need to break we need to break the, the mold a wee bit perhaps in relation to these um and if we were going to do that uh, I'll make a I'll, I'll make a proposal we actually overturn the officer recommendation on this particular occasion um and the simple fact is someone already said it I think it was Councillor Dobbins and that is actually that the reason for refusal um it may well not uh be this glamping site may well not be located within the grounds of an existing hotel or self-catering complex or close to an existing approved what's approved mean tourist amenity uh and of course all the other things and it's not a replacement of an existing clan but i would argue that it actually is in um it's not close to it is in an existing approved tourist amenity and that tourist amenity is the area of outstanding natural beauty known as the Sperns. And if we really wanted to stretch it, you could actually say that it's close to Gorchen Glen Forest Park, the Seamus Heaney home place, and indeed Nesswood, uh, which I'm sure many tourists would enjoy visiting. So that's that's my take on it, Chair, and I'm proposing we overturn the recommendation on that basis. Yeah, Councillor Dobbins already wants to to propose it, but Councillor Kelly has a question, if that's okay. Thanks, Dan? Thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, it's more, um, well, I don't know if there is a question, it's certainly a comment. Um, I think everything that's that's been said uh, by members who've spoken on it, I, I, I agree with. Um, and I, I, I'm, I suppose I'm a bit disappointed, given that I've heard the officer describe that this is a weighted decision that we've kind of once again come down in the decision of refusal, and it's it's that continuous sort of um, sort of rigid interpretation of the policy that that's uh, irritated me again, and I suppose sports provoked me to kind of speak. And the the issue I have is around this artificial uh, distinction, you know, whether it's a, a, an asset uh, or whether it's, a, it's an amenity. And I, my, my take on it is, and I, I, I so further to everything that's been said, is that the sparings themselves are the asset, but the AONB is the amenity. And the reason for saying that is because the sparing AONB, the sparing, sparing area of outstanding natural beauty, was de designated under the Amenity Lands Act 1965. But not all AONBs in the North are designated under that le legislation. Uh, some of them were, are designated much later under the 1985 legislation. But the Sperns is designated under the Amenity Lands Act. So how is it not an amenity? How can it not be interpreted as an amenity when it is designated itself under the Amenity Lands Act? And it's this, uh, it, it's frustrating that I find this being presented to council, you know, as, as this is not a tourist amenity. How how is it that the council itself has a camper van facility in the middle of the Glenelly Valley, nowhere near anything, nowhere near anything, and it's there because the Sparren A O N B, the area of outstanding natural beauty, is the amenity. That's where people want to come, they want to park up, and they want to go and walk. And this is. It's so frustrating that we're back. I just find myself every time we have one of these applications, we seem to be back at square one. And it's it's this rigid interpretation of policy. I don't have a question, but I just want to um, I want to make the comment again because I do find it so frustrating that we always find ourselves back at square one in our council area uh, when it comes to trying to uh, push the whole agenda for tourism in the Spern uh, area and region, and particularly within the AONB. Um, and I. Uh, uh, as as well as everything that's been said to date, uh, my my uh, my weighting will be heavily influenced by the fact that the Sparen AONB is designated under the Amenity Lands Act, uh, 1965. And I just wanted to put that comment in there, and uh, before we go to a vote, thanks, Chair. Thank you, uh, 
Councillor Dobbins. Yeah, Chair. Councillor Boyle has made a proposal, or do you want to make it? Uh, uh, come here, listen. I, I can 100% behind uh, Councillor Kelly's. I can hear his frustration there, and I'm 100% in agreement with him. Um, I'm not precious by who makes the proposal, only for the mere fact that um, that was Maliki has done um, and made a very good presentation. I, I, for one, am not in agreement, and therefore the proposal is to overturn the refusal, which I'm in agreement. So happy to second that uh, proposal. Thanks, Chair. Can I also suggest, Chair, that we actually add that latter bit of what Councillor Kelly was referencing, the 1975 Immunity Act, because that is actually a very strong argument, that, and I think something that would be useful uh, presenting for 75, 76, 65, good God, is it old as that? That's older than me, Chair. There you go. Um, I have, I have what, irrespective of what year it was, uh, maybe we add that on to it uh, for a reason for overturning. Is there any dissenting voices? Anyone against? Any abstentions? All in favour? Yeah. Unanimous. Thank you, members. Thank you, David. Item there nine. There's. Thank you. So item nine, there's one late item. Uh, it's just one letter, so just take a minute or two to read it. Okay, members, um, item nine, 
and Katrina. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Um, item nine is um, LA 11 2021 uh, 0831. It's an outline application for a proposed dwelling and garage immediately east of 22 Lake Patrick Road, Artigarvin Straban, and the recommendation is to refuse. Um, so uh, the first slide here is the site location. Uh, the site is located on the Lake Patrick Road, approximately 400 metres east of the junction with the main A5 Victoria Road and approximately 800 metres outside of the village of Ballymagore. Um, the site itself is the southern roadside section of an agricultural field. Site frontage is approximately 190 metres long with a roadside hedge running along the frontage. Uh, to the west of the site is a row of uh, dwellings, um, a gap and then a church. Uh, to the east of the site is an access lane and you can see there on the location plan um, the housing uh, that's there. Um, at the junction from the A5 is St Patrick's Church and Mulligan Memorial Hall and you'll probably be uh, aware of that driving between Derry and Strabane. So this is a picture of the application site. Um, it shows the application site almost level with the junction at uh, Maple Road, just looking under the site. So the policy context of this is a Straban area plan, a strategic plan and policy statement, uh, PPS 21, PPS 2, PPS 3, PPS 6 and building on tradition. So um, the applicant's design and access statement has made reference to the site be, wanting to be considered under policy CTY2A of PPS 21, which deals with new dwellings and existing clusters. All six of these criteria have to be met. Um, so the, the criteria are as listed. The, the cluster of development lies outside of a farm and consists of four or more dwellings. Um, there's further slides and we'll go through them then. Um, we consider that that is satisfied. The cluster appears as a visual entity in the local landscape. We don't think it meets that. The cluster is associated with a focal point, such as a social community building facility, or is located at a crossroads. That has been satisfied because of the church uh, on, along the road. Um, the identified site provides a suitable degree degree of enclosure and is bounded on at least two sides with other development in the cluster. That's not satisfied. Uh, development of the site can be absorbed into the existing cluster through rounding off and consolidation and will not significantly alter its existing character. Um, we consider that not satisfied and development would not adversely impact in residential amenity. Well, this is an outline application. So at this stage, we would say that that's satisfied because that would be down to design. So the criteria one um, is that the cluster lies outside of a farm and consists of four or more buildings. So you can see here that it definitely meets that criteria. So this is criteria two, the site that we think the site doesn't appear as a visual entity in the local landscape. This is when you're traveling from the east down back towards the Victoria Road. And um, you can see here identified on that uh, picture, there's number 20 and number 22. Um, you can just about make out number 22 and you can see the roof of number 20. So we are saying that this site doesn't appear as part of the cluster. So this is from the main road. This is the view that most of you would be familiar with. Um, so from the Victoria Road, you can see the church and the hall, and then you can see a gap. And then you can see the vegetation there to the right of the photograph and some of those dwellings, you can sort of make them out. Now, um, this appears more as two groups of buildings, more than one big cluster. Um, likewise, when you travel along this road, there is a natural bend at the end of, I'll just scroll back to the, to show you the context. So here, there's a natural bend here. So when you travel along, there's a, there's a very natural break where the, that cluster ends. It, it isn't very visible on the location map, but it's very visible when you're on the site. So, sorry, just scroll back down. 
So criteria four there, the site is only bounded on one side. As you can see there, number 22 would be the only bit that there is um, bulk development. Um, so it doesn't meet that criteria. So there is no development to the north and the south. So then um, after CTY2A, we've also considered policy CTY8. So um, CTY8 permits the development of a small gap sufficient only to accommodate up to a maximum of two houses within an otherwise substantial and continuously built up frontage. The pattern should respect the size, scale and plot size in the area. So you can see here that this is the application site and, and just for ease, we've measured all the frontages along there. So you can clearly see that even if you were taking the bigger frontages of say 55 meters, you're nearly fit, being able to fit four houses in there. So the gap site should only be able to accommodate two. So we're saying that it doesn't comply with um, CTY8 and therefore it wouldn't be exception. Now, part of CTY8 is also that it would erode the character and create a ribbon. So under that policy, then we would consider that it would also fail the policy test in CTY14. So in terms of other policy consideration, um, in terms of residential amenity, there's no overlooking or loss of light, um, basically because this is outline and it would be down to appropriate design. Under PPS3, DFI roads have no objections. Uh, PPS2, Natural Heritage, approximately 20 metres of the hedgerow along the front of the site um, would have to be uh, removed to provide new access. Um, the ecologist has recommended the hedgerow to be removed outside the bird breeding season and compensated by new native species hedgerow. Um, so where there would be no follow-up habitat or species surveys recommended and um, HED monuments um, are content with the proposal. So um, there was a late item received um, from uh, Daniel McCrossan, MLA. Um, so just to summarise his uh, late item, uh, there's been no objections from local residents. It's not a speculative application. It's to allow the applicant's daughter to build a home on the family farm. Um, the applicant has looked at an alternative site on Lower Town Road, but rejected that site due to the quantity of earthworks necessary to create a safe access onto Lower Town Road. Um, on the location plan, the Lower Town Road is just to the top of the site, so the whole thing sort of runs in a triangle. Um, other than a gap adjacent to 12 Lake Patrick Road, there is continuous line of development between the church and the application site. This gap is owned by the church and is, should be considered as part of the curtilage of St. Patrick's Church. Um, just to say, just for clarification, um, we've never been um, given any um, consideration of CTY10 and they've never submitted anything. And this is the first that they're saying about the family farm. And we've also never received any information about the lower town road site. Um, so in summary, um, the proposal is contrary to policy CTY1. The proposal fails to meet three of the criteria of policy CTY2A, which prevents new dwellings in existing clusters. The proposal is not considered to be a small gap um, outlined as an exception to policy CTY8. The proposal would add to a ribbon of development uh, contrary to policy CTY8 and CTY14. And the proposal would add to a suburban style build up of development contrary to CTY 14, and the proposal would not visually integrate into the surrounding landscape contrary to policy CTY 13. And the refusal reasons are as detailed in the planning officer's report. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. And we have a speaker, maybe two speakers. We have David Young, the agent, and James McKean, the applicant. If you want to go ahead. So, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, hear you, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I think I'll probably be the, the only speaker on the application, so um, am I good to go? Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to address you today in respect to this application. Um, as I said earlier in the earlier submissions, the applicant the application is for the applicant to allow his daughter to build her own home and the locality where she lives and currently lives and works. Um, the application was selected 
due to it being at an existing cluster of development associated with St. Patrick's Church and the Mulligan Hall further along the Lake Patrick Road. Um, it sits really low in the surrounding landscape and that has been demonstrated in the photograph at figure five of the case officer's report. Um, it shows that the site is well screened um, on the boundary of the 22 and its surroundings as well as the intervening um, roadside hedges. It's also linked to St. Patrick's Church, indicated in, in yellow at figure four, and there's a continuous line of development between the church and the application site. Um, the cluster is a long established one, and as a result, uh, there's a lot of mature vegetation has grown up. And whilst that may reduce its appearance as a visual entity in the landscape, uh, we would contend that it is uh, a visual entity in the landscape to the members of the local community and that's apparent as you travel along that stretch of Lake Patrick Road. Um, it's intended that the dwelling would sit in the corner of the field there just opposite Maple Road and wouldn't protrude into the wider field um, where we would plan to make use of the side and also the rear boundary of 22 where we could position our garage and ancillary buildings and that sort of stuff um, so and therefore it provides a suitable degree of enclosure and um, rounds off the development uh, you know in, the, in this part of the locality and the curvature of the Lake Patrick Road means that only a small amount of roadside haze can be needs to be removed to create a safe access. Um, the case officer also alluded to uh, the gap site being considered. Um, if you look at the sites further along the road, 24 and the one beside it, the frontage of those two together measure approximately 122 metres. Um, by virtue of the shape of the site, the post field to this application, there are triangles at both ends, which in effect sort of sterilise uh, a piece at each side. And if you take those off, um, the frontage would be measured at approximately 125 metres. So, I mean, you're, you're not far away then from the from the developments further along the road. It's a wee bit hard to get that point across in this presentation, but I hope you sort of get the the uh, what I'm trying to say. So, um, so we would. That's basically all I have to say, other than to just reiterate that all the consultees are content. And it's not a speculative application, it's for a member of the applicant's family. And we would ask that favourable consideration would be given by members and that the case officer's recommendation can be overturned. Thank you, members. Thank you, David. Uh, any questions for the agent? Mr McClintock. Thanks, Chair, and thank you, David, for your presentation. Just for a wee bit of clarity, I'm looking at figure four uh, on our case officer's report, and I, and I absolutely take on board your point of these triangles. It is an unusual shape of a uh, piece of ground, and I take on board those triangles, which don't really, I know they contribute to 190 metres, but I think that figure that you give of 125 certainly would be maybe more accurate that that site if i'm right that does, it's not really seen from the main road but just just for a point of clarity i know you mentioned this but i i sort of went over my head a wee bit you said the site of the proposed siting of the house would was on the corner near to number 24 could you just reiterate that for me please no i'm sorry if that came across like that uh the siting would be at, at closer to 22 that'd be at the western corner of the site. Thanks. That that makes sense to me. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, my apologies if that came across wrongly. Okay. Any other questions for uh, the agent? Uh, uh, Chair. Chair. Uh, Alderman Kerrigan here. Okay. Sorry, I'm on the phone. Can I come on briefly? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Th uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Chair, just on Korean here with the agent, um, he has referenced the uh well sorry we have looked at i suppose a gap site when i've been looking at these notes and uh we've also been looking at cty2a but i i would have a query there 
well, I'll ask the agent his opinion of it there. As my opinion on, on knowing that road to a certain extent and knowing the location and the dwellings on it, I would have reminded that the actual cluster, and I'm querying with the agent if he would agree or if he would have a different opinion, the cluster includes the dwelling houses that are up to number 22 uh, from the church and the church hall there, but also on the on the other side of the site. There is, uh, I can't just recall the, the number of it, uh, I'm going to say number 24, whatever it is, and there's two dwelling houses up a lane alongside that, and there's, two, uh, there's another dwelling house beside it, and there's another dwelling house opposite it. So I would have been minded that that is, is the full size of the cluster, and there is still a potential of a gap site, and I'm querying the agent whether he would have come to that conclusion. Um, I would also there query, I would ask the agent's opinion there in relation to the um, uh, he has referenced the 190 metres, and it is mentioned there. And again, uh, you know, there's a wee nuke, as I would call it, there beside number 22, which I would state is uh, there's not much, there's not much in it. Uh, you, you know that you, you couldn't get a house in it. I, I, I and I'm querying there with the agent would feel that it would be more, it, it potentially could be a gap site for two. Years. Where I'm coming from is. You know, uh, there's 190 metres, yes, but DFI road service are requesting 70 metres for sight lines for, for the site. So effectively, I would be minded you wouldn't have that uh, situation that you could get a third one in there. But it's, it's just it's just that the agent can take, uh, can query, uh, can, if he can reply, if he would be minded that the cluster is larger. Uh, uh, that would be a fair comment in his opinion and in relation to the sight lines there. At the moment, thank you, Chair. Uh, can I answer that? Yeah. yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, as you travel further along that stretch of Lake Patrick Road, there's quite a lot of houses there, even beyond number 24 and, and the one beside it. And as uh, Alderman Kerrigan has referred to, there's houses just uh, opposite 24 as well. And even if you travel further along, you know, you start to get into the settlement of Hardy Garvin there as well. So there is quite a lot of development on that stretch of road there. Um, yeah, and then in relation to his point about the DFI roads, um, the access is probably going to be roughly halfway along the site to achieve the, the 70 metre forward sight line. Uh, so yes, there's probably just potential for two houses, for an access for two houses. So. Um, so there's not really the option to have three or four sites in there. So I hope that answers his question. Happy enough, Commissioner Kerrigan? Uh, I, I chair at present. I, I'm content enough at present. Thank you. Councillor Dobbins. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, can I just ask the agent there? Um, why was there no reference made to this application being for um, a family member, i.e. the daughter, or is this um, a late decision? And why there was no reference that alternative site had been um, looked at uh, and the problems with that site? Why were they not made known uh, at the time of application? Oh, well, I mean, it's just a but get it across to the committee that there's no speculation in this application. Um, it is a genuine application by um, the McKeon family to have a, a site for their daughter. And, uh, you know, they, and then as regards the other application, it was sort of discounted because it was, we were looking for just different opportunities and we thought, went for what we thought was the best opportunity. You know to fulfil the needs of the of the applicant. Um, the other unfilled site is a very high and prominent site. You would definitely see it as you're travelling along the A5, and and the curvature of the road means you'll be sort of opening up the entire frontage of the site, and and sort of the earthworks and all that were associated with that. So it's just to sort of put across the thought process of how we arrived at the application. So. Um, it's perhaps not totally relevant, but I just throw it in there as background to your thought process. You, are you happy enough, Councillor Dobbins? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Councillor Boyle. I just for clarity, um, David, 
David, in your, in your mind, then what kind of site? Um, what, what kind of site does this represent that we're looking at here? Is this a gap site? Is this rounding off? Is it part of a cluster? Um, uh, and on what basis did you make that application? Uh, I mean, it, it, it can be many things, and, and all things the all men and all women here. But I mean, I, I, I am bearing in mind the measurements, and I've, I've also borne in mind, you know, that you know, you've mentioned the 125 meters. If we remove the 190 meters, initially I was actually looking at the 190, um, and going by the measurements of the nearby properties, that would have meant that you could have got five of those houses into this one site. If we actually take that down to 125 meters, then we could probably have, we could probably get um, numbers. Uh, hang on, bear with me. We could probably get numbers 12, 16, and 18 under this site. Um, and if we we could also look at it at 127 meters, we could probably get houses number 18, 18A, 20, and 22 under this site, and that would be measuring 125 metres and not 190. So at 125 metres, we could get four of those nearby houses under this one site, um, or three of those nearby houses under this one site. Uh, it certainly isn't a gap site. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, the policy talks about respecting the, the development and the, and the locality. So, I mean, if you consider the wider locality. I mean, certainly number twenty-four and the one beside it has a has a wider frontage. So, I mean, that's sort of what we would be basing our argument on. That you know, you'd only fit two of those on there. Um, so, yeah, just to, just to come back on that. However, uh, David, you did you did suggest that the 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 house would be developed in the bottom left hand corner uh, around and beside number twenty two and not beside numbers number twenty four. Um, yep. The the massing of the houses twenty two to twelve to twenty two um, would suggest to me that a house of the of the size of number twenty four would not be in keeping and would be uncharacteristic to the houses that would be directly beside it, numbers twelve to twenty two. I can see your point. If, if the, if the point could be made if this house was going to be located at the other end of the field, but that's not what you said. No, but we number twenty four is actually a two story house, so I mean we would be um, proposing a, like a single story or a story and a half development. So uh, you know which would be in keeping with the area. So. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, David. No more questions for the agent. Questions to the officer. Councillor Gallagher. Thank you. Just a question for the officer. As I'm, I'm reluctant to this wide gap for 190 and the possibility if we can talk to one side. Uh, and if, if this was approved, does this site risk further infill uh, that could end up looking like a full ribbon development, you know, from Ari Garvin to Balmagori that would completely change the whole landscape of that area? Yeah, that's why, why one of the refusal reasons is ribbon development, because, um, you know, if you did even cite it where they're suggesting they cite it, um, there's a natural break on that corner and that line of houses um, as you get round the corner then it looks rural again and then you get those other houses there at 24 so it if if one was done you know where they're suggesting that they put it it would add to the ribbon and then there is the potential probably for reapplications for a rounding off of that and a rounding off of that you know so yeah. Any other questions? Mr. Boyd? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Keep it brief. Um, be a long day. Uh, Katrina, uh, the, your is obviously this is just an outline application. I mean, I, I, I can see the challenges presented by the site as well. I would imagine that the EFA may well have some some particular concerns in relation to the location of, uh, of a property directly on that bend. 
Yeah, they've asked for um, the, for the access to be taken further down, which then probably would lead to its own argument that the development is happening further down and not rounding off. Do you know, so that the the it won't be on the bend; it will be on down, nearly in the middle of the application. I was going to say so effectively in yeah. the middle of the field. Yeah. Yeah. To make it possible. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, Chair, Chair Alderman Kerrigan here. Um, uh, very briefly, Chair. Um, the, 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 surely, Chair, just the officer there, the, the answer to the last question, you, you know, if DFI have issues in regards to where an instance would be, surely that is as, as, as validating the point I raised in regards to at least 70 metres there, and surely it's, it's, Leaving it such at the point that you know you could fit five dwelling houses into that site, you couldn't because the EFI wouldn't be allowing it due to the, the the entrance. So surely that's the case that that there, if there is an issue in regards to the roads, and we're asking the officers this, uh, uh, you know, on the entrance, is that not something in there in relation to that? It, it offsets this 190 metres figure that is being pushed there in relation to the size of this site compared to other sites. So I'm just wanting the officers uh, input on that. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, Roads have uh, cleared the application, so they haven't raised concerns with it being on the bend because this is an outline application. They've just um, given us an RS1 form saying that they have to provide visibility space of 2.4 by 70 um, in each direction. So it would be up then, at, if this was approved at reserve matter stage, you would have to go 70 metres along, you know, and then have another 70 metres. So essentially 140 metres of the frontage would have to be the visibility displays. So the, the, it's not that roads have come back and said, you can't have it in the bend. They have just specified what they will need at the next stage. And then when those drawings would be submitted, they would assess those. Does that uh, clarify it? Thank, thank you, thank you. Mara, Mara wants to come on here just. Yeah, just briefly members, just a reminder, you know, obviously if we're looking at this, um, you know, a few members have mentioned this, you know, what policy are we applying here? You know, we can't just cherry pick three different policies to take out different um, definitions. And I suppose at this point, you know, we're looking at this as a considered as a gap site. So that is that po this one policy that we're looking at. And I suppose in regards to, you know, if we go into the detail, which we're being asked to do in terms of the policy um, of the plot sizes, you know, we can't cherry pick either on each side, you know, of which side the, the, the scale of the, the frontage is there. But even bearing in mind some of the commentary, you know, 180 metres and you take off the tail, you know, it's only 10 metres or so. You're still talking about 180 frontage here. And I suppose what I would argue, I've done my figures here as well, even on the basis of a 25 metre plot size on the left hand side, which is the argument that it is um, based on, you know, simply the, the point that Councillor Boyle was making, that would equate to eight, you know, nearly eight dwellings is, is what I have figured out here. And even for the sake of argument, you average that out. Um, to 45, when you go from 25 to 66, you're talking, uh, you're still talking about four and a half dwellings or four dwellings. But moreover, if you're looking at what the argument is now that we're only going to be starting halfway through the gap site, you know, you put halfway through it, you're still going to have three dwellings or four dwellings at best, you know, depending on where that visible display allows you to go in, even if we don't know the road service at a later date will allow more on the left hand side. I suppose just, you know, um, you know, we just can't ignore some of the facts there in front of us. Um, we're not taken away from the fact that it is a road frontage site. Um, clearly, we argue and discuss that many a day. Um, but I just think members just need to be mindful of what's in the policy at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Maura. Councillor McClintock, last call. Thanks, Chair. And it's just again for clarity, and this might be a stupid question, but I suppose there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, this site kind of goes round the corner. Uh, to me, that reads along with the 55 and the 66 metres on the Lake Patrick Road. 
rather than on the other road where all those other houses are. And I suppose I know we're saying it's a gap site and not a ribbon of development, but that whole idea of, of um, it going round the corner, the frontage of it is going to come out onto the Lake Patrick Road, if I'm right, alongside the 55 and the 66. Am I completely in the wrong track? Or because they would add up to together to 121 metres of a site. So um, I think that what the agent was trying to say was that they were wanting to round off the development, if you see on the picture there, beside 22 and the 55, the one with the 55 and the 60 odd um, is over the other side beside that laneway. So they're wanting to read it, you know, at the end of 22 in that corner there. I find it difficult to read it with that. It, it makes more sense to me reading it with the other two, but I'll take your point, Katrina. I just one last point, just for clarity. I mean, ultimately, when we if we pass this, this will go to um, uh, this will go to DFA. DFA will probably say that it needs displays of X, um, uh, and we've already debated that. And I, I have a no doubt about where that leaves us particular development and that would basically leave this in the middle of that field and so it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be part of any cluster um it's definitely as, as we can all see from the, the size of the site that it's not a gap site it doesn't fit that particular part of the criteria but ultimately when it would all pan out we would be sitting there with a house in the middle of a huge field and then we actually will have created two more gap sites and that, to me, is defeats the whole purpose of having those particular policies and planning uh, legislation. Uh, and so I'm just going to spell it out here. For me, this doesn't work. I can see nothing that mitigates it to make it work for me, Chair. Uh, if anybody, if, if people don't have any other questions, I'm going to make a proposal, Chair, so I'll leave it at that for now. Any other questions? Just... No. Proposal? Well, I think it predictably enough, Chair. I, I think uh, it's right the proposal. We, we accept the officer recommendation to refuse the application on this occasion. Mr. Gallagher, seconded. Okay, we'll pick a vote. Moral call vote. Thank you, Chair. Um, members, this is a recorded vote for item nine, and uh, the proposal is to accept the officer's recommendation. Alderman Alan Breslin? Yes. Alderman Derek Hussey? Apologies. Alderman Keith Kerrigan? Alderman Keith Kerrigan? I'll come back. Against, Mara, um, sorry, against. Yeah, got, okay, got you. Thank you, Keith. Alderman Hilary McClintock? Against, Mara. Councillor Jason Barr? Against. Councillor John Boyle? Or. Councillor Angela Dobbins? Or, Mara. <coughs> Thank you. Um, Councillor Paul Gallagher? Or. Councillor Christopher Jackson? Against, Mara. Councillor Dan Kelly. Councillor Kelly. I'll come back. Councillor Patricia Logue. Councillor Patricia Logue. I'll come back again. Councillor Kieran Maguire. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Philip McKinney. Apologies. Councillor Sean Mooney. Thank you. I'll just go back. There's a few there we didn't get on the call out. Um, so back to Councillor Dan Kelly. Apologies, Maura. I was uh, caught up out there during the vote. Uh, I'm against. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Patricia Logue. 
Councillor Patricia on the call, even. Patricia just on. Patricia's there, yeah. No, no nothing there, Chair. Yeah. Um, so that's one, two, three, four, four, and three, um, seven against. So that proposal falls. Okay, that proposal falls. Is there another proposal? Chair, uh, Alderman Kerrigan, if I can come in briefly. Okay, so it's proposal, no no more questions. Yeah, uh, uh, sorry, a uh, uh, proposal, if that's all right. Uh, Chair, I see there's five refusal reasons there. And uh, sorry, I'm trying to, trying to work out my notes here of whatever it's down. Uh, the first refusal reason, uh, that, uh, I'm minded that uh, CTY1 PPS21 that, that it's not required, no no need for this, this dwelling in this location. I mean, it's the ban area plan 123.2.1, the rural remainder, uh, will, will can, can counteract that first argument. The the second argument is CTY2A and the six criteria. Um, and it does state that it meets criteria one, criteria three, and criteria six can be met with the reserve matters. Uh, <coughs> Chair, I am more minded. It depends. Well, that and my reading of that uh, CT that that uh, document in relation to CTY2A as in reference to the cluster. And I'm minded that point two, there is a visual entity, the visual link with Lake Patrick Church is the focal point. I'd be minded that there is. Uh, sorry, that's point three. Um, that that uh, there is. The, the the size of the cluster, sorry, this is the issue. Chair, I would be minded that the cluster includes the dwelling houses uh, beside the church and the other dwelling houses, which I previously mentioned, uh, that uh, as the two dwelling houses together and the two up the lane. So I'm minded that it is enclosed uh, on the two sides because of the laneway on that side. And I am minded that it does factor into round and off when you incorporate the entire cluster. So, and that's that's that uh, in regards to my second one. The third one is CTY 8 PPS 21, uh, a gap site. I, again, I would be minded if we include all the dwellings in that section there, that uh, it is deemed as a gap site. A gap site is the site for no more than two dwelling houses uh, and another right substantially built up frontage. And I would be minded that when you're classifying, when you're taking the full cluster, the, the full line of dwellings house, that it, can be pushed into that. Uh, number four, um, CTY8 and CTY14 ribbon and suburban style. I would mind it if you look at the area yeah. and if you go on that area for, uh, around that location, that uh, uh, very much, uh, Chair, uh, very much does fall in with the character of the area and that road from Ballamagori heading into Lake Patrick and heading around by Ardy Garvin. And my first reason, uh, CTY 13 PPS 21, uh, again, I'm pushing on the natural boundaries in regard to it, uh, Chair. And I'm minded that, that if need be, the site could be located in closer behind number 22, where the red line is drawn, and an entrance can be pushed further out, wherever DFI deem appropriate. But again, it is outlined, but I'm minded if we take that uh, it is the full gap site, uh, I am minded that we can get away that it is a, uh, a gap site with a, with a full boundary. So, yeah, that's my reading of it, my interpretation. So, I would be minded to make that proposal. Thank you very much, Chair. Councillor Kerrigan, have we a seconder? I'd second it. Councillor Esland or McClintock, would he over? <laughs> Councillor Bresland. Yeah. Chair, just on, on the ribbon, ribbon development and, and, uh, and protecting the countryside, I think that this, this uh, if, if, if it was supported, leaves a great risk of creating like almost a circle uh, around Balmagori, uh, up through Arne Garvin and, and back down through that high risks and I feel very much risks the real character of, of the entire area that I and on a future date we could be I uh, regretting decisions of taking this forward this application. 
Don't disagree with anything that Councillor Gallagher's just said, Chair, and I just want to put it on the record that I actually genuinely do not accept um, uh, uh, Alderman Kerrigan's um, explanations for how we can reject all five of the refu uh, refusal reasons in front of us. I simply could not support uh, his, um, uh, his, uh, his definitions, shall we say, um, uh, and I I would like that placed on the record. I, I, I have very genuine, real concerns about the passing of an application like this in front of this planning committee, and I support Councillor Geller's view on, on, on future development in areas like Ballymagory, etc. And Chair Angela here, I, I too would like it on record. Um, no way can all five of those refusal reasons be um overturned um i don't accept um alderman kerrigan's views on that and um yeah i would like to put it on record as well i, I don't think it, it that doesn't sit well with me whatsoever a vote now um it's been proposed and seconded um mara you take us through thank you chair Members, this is a vote for item nine, proposal not to accept officer's recommendation. Um, Alderman Alan Breslin. For. Alderman Derek Hussey. Apologies. Alderman Keith Kerrigan. For Mara. Thank you. Alderman Hilary McClintock. For. Um, Councillor Jason Barr. For. Councillor John Boyle. Against, obviously. Councillor Angela Dobbins. Against Moral. Thank you. Um, Councillor Paul Gallagher. Against. Councillor Christopher Jackson. For Moral. Okay. Councillor Dan Kelly. For Moral. Thank you. Councillor Patricia Logue. For. Thank you. Councillor Kim McGuire. For. Councillor Philip McKinney. Apologies. And Councillor Sean Mooney. Thank you. And that's that's eight for and four against and no abstentions. Hey members. We have a few items left. Do you want to run through them quickly or come back tomorrow? Okay. Yeah, yeah, Chair, go ahead. Okay. Item it for decision. Yeah. Members, um, this is a very just a brief update. This is a notice of opinion from DFI regarding the planning application for the Maritime Museum. Um, this is a council application and was a reserve matters case. Um, uh, as it wasn't a full reserve matters, as you know, as a result of outline you know, the application was brought in by the minister before transfer. So that's why those reserved matters are still being processed by DFI, just as a wee reminder. But that notice of opinion is to approve and that 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 is a standard letter just to allow council, should they wish to um, have a hearing on the matter. So um, we would have imagined, given the nature of the application and this at this stage, that um, members wouldn't be seeking a hearing. So you can see our report and um, we have no no issues with it or no no further comments to make. Um, that's it, Chair. Um, who's we going to confidential? Post Councillor Boyle, seconded. Councillor McClintock. 